Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh and welcome to this new series by Sapiens Institute. This new series is going to focus on scientific errors or the supposed scientific errors narrative which is propounded by some of the anti-Muslim apologists. This series deals with the most notable contentions as per mentions of these particular contentions on different anti-Islamic websites and publications. This is brought to you by Sapiens Institute, an institute which focuses on two primary things. Number one is to further the cause of Islam, to make rational arguments for Islam. And that ranges from making arguments from God's existence to the oneness of God, all the way through to the revelation of the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, and the proof of his prophethood. The second objective is that Sapiens Institutes deals with the most contentious and controversial objections against Islam. And this is where this series fits into the scheme of work, if you like, of what we do. We have decided to spend some months actually collating data and using the interdisciplinary approach where we consult with scientists, with theologians, with scholars of different backgrounds within the Islamic tradition, and of course, with philosophers of science, to come to conclusions about the extent to which there is in fact a conflict, a supposed conflict, between what is observably uh, observable to us, empirically let's say, and the Quranic text. This of course requires knowledge in many different areas and I would like to thank all of those who contributed to this series before I begin. Now, this video comprises of the, as I've mentioned, most common contentions. You may see the most common contentions in the description box below because you might not need answers to all of them. So you might have a particular contention that you would like answered rather than all of them. And so you can go to the description box, which will act like a contents page, and you can click on the particular objection that you would like to be answered. In this way, this will act like a virtual web database on the matter of supposed scientific discrepancies in the Quran. Now, here's the thing. Before we begin, it's very important that we say from the outset, that whatever school of philosophical thought you take on the philosophy of science, whether you are a realist or an anti-realist, you must, you must realize that even the best scientific theories with the best kind of predictive power are, are susceptible to change. This is the dynamism and the transient nature of the scientific method. If it were not so, then falsification would not be something which could happen. So science is not a set of uh, eternal truths and incorrigible facts. To the contrary, science is transient and dynamic. To the contrary, science can change. Even that which is known to us as scientific fact can in fact change. As we know through the great works of Thomas Kuhn, where he refers to these as scientific revolutions. Not just scientific facts change, but the entire paradigm wherein which science operates may undergo what is referred to as scientific revolution. So this has happened many times in history. And so it's important from the outset not to have an expectation that there must be a perfect correlation between today's science of 2021, for example, and every single verse of the Qur'an and every single hadith that there is that is authentic. This is not a reasonable expectation, not least because the scientific method itself is in flux. However, having said this, anything which is observably real and true and has very high epistemic weight from an empirical perspective, we would say that truth cannot contradict the Qur'anic narrative. And so, Bearing all of these things in mind, it's important to approach the topic of science in the Qur'an 
with care and nuance and sophistication. I hope this series is something which you can benefit from. It is certainly something which we have put a lot of time in, a lot of effort in. And we will be doing this with major themes of narratives against Islam from morality all the way through to uh, arguments, as we've said, of God's existence. And hopefully you can benefit and share this video to all those who you think will benefit. Today, inshallah, we're going to be dealing with a hadith uh, which references uh, Adam alayhi salam, a prophet of Islam, as being 60 cubits tall, which is like 27 meters. And they say this is unbelievable and impossible. But before we get to this hadith, let's talk about the Islamic stance on the theory of evolution. Generally speaking, talking about the theory of evolution, Muslims don't have an issue or shouldn't really have an issue with speciation, adaptation, or even uh, evolution of animals, because we believe that uh, there's nothing explicit in the Quran one way or the other. And I actually done a podcast with Abdullah al ajayri Sheikh Abdullah al ajayri is a prominent figure in Saudi Arabia, uh, who researches these matters and well published in, in this field. And uh, in my discussion with him, this was his opinion. So, which is quite frankly like 99.9% .9 if we look at it from a mass perspective, really 99.9% .9 of the theory. The, uh, the issue we have, um, we take issue with, or the point of evolution, the sliver of which really diametrically opposes some of the Islamic narratives is uh, human evolution. Now, obviously, we have a narrative. We have a narrative in Islam, which is that the Adam alayhi salam was created directly, or this prophet Adam was created directly by Allah, by God Almighty. And there are many things which differentiate human beings from the rest of the animal kingdom. Morality, the, uh, the ability to question why, you know, um, this uh, many different in language, civilization, and so on and so forth. And it couldn't have been the case, we would argue, that we can actually in any way be, uh, be equated uh, to the rest of the animal kingdom. And there's something special about human beings. Allah says in the Quran that he has dignified the ch children of Adam. So we, we don't necessarily agree or disagree. We can remain agnostic as to uh, you know, Darwinian evolution with other animals. But as it relates to uh, the human being, there is something special about the human being. And that is why Allah created human being directly. And uh, in this hadith, there's indication that he created Adam in uh, 60 cubits tall. Now, the question is, this seems unscientific on many grounds. And I'll tell you what, on three major grounds. Number one is biological. Number two is archaeological and or paleontological, we could say as well, from a fossil record perspective. And number three, uh, looking at the kind of uh, disparity in sizes, if we do assume that there was a human being of uh, such great magnitude in terms of size, how can we explain the fact uh, that human beings are like, uh, give or take, you know, six foot tall, give or take, you know, a half a meter or whatever it may be, or more, right? But how can you explain this huge disparity in the fact that you're saying that you believe in Adam, who's 27 meters tall and, and, and a human being now, which is, you know, typically anything between five foot five to six foot five. And obviously there are extremities on, on both sides of that equation. There's more people that are taller than six foot five like myself and people that are shorter than five foot five like uh, many, many people. So here, there's two parts of the hadith which we need to pay attention to, uh, which is the first part of the hadith talks about that Allah created Adam, uh, uh, 60 uh, cubits tall and in terms of hadith there are some narrations which don't mention this 60 cubits and that don't, the, 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 there are some narrations that do mention the 60 cubits but we don't say that just because there are some narrations that don't mention the 60 cubits that the narrations that do mention the 60 cubits are erroneous that makes no sense actually uh, this this doesn't and some people have attempted to argue uh, that this means that this should be uh, disbanded. No, it doesn't mean that's not how the hadith science works. So that's the first thing. Other people say the second part of the hadith, which talks about uh, that the, 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 the creation is, um, is, is, is becoming smaller and smaller until now. 
they found it problematic because they, Ibn Hajar himself, he mentions, how could it be the case that this is happening, right? The, the, and we can see Ad and Thamud's uh, kind of uh, indwellings, the, the archaeolog archaeological remnants of their indwellings, and we can see that their houses and the, you know, the doors and so on were not so tall. And he assumed, and without, by the way, nafs and evidence, that... Uh, Ad and Thamud were closer to Adam than they were to us human beings. And obviously the, the only real evidence we have anything between Nuh and Adam alayhi uh, salam is, there's no evidence. I mean, there's only uh, Israeliyat or kind of biblical narrations. So potentially he was using those to kind of uh, raise his eyebrow, but he did not say that this hadith was mu'allal or defective, as many believe that he did. Now having, oh, because of nas reasons or co content reasons. Going now forward to answering the contentions, there are variations of this hadith which refer to Fissama, okay, that this was in the heaven. Not heaven as in Jannah, but Fissama. Now, obviously, if you look at the Quranic cosmology, heaven, Al Jannah, is above, okay, because obviously we know that the Prophet was taken there in the Salat al Maraj. So it could be the case that this height and this mega size of 27 meters is specific to Jannah and there's nothing wrong linguistically in believing that because obviously we believe that Adam alayhi salam he started his journey yes in heaven I mean we have a whole narrative where he was in a completely different place and then Allah he sent him down to the earth he sent him down to the earth yes he's created from the elements of the earth but he was in many ways, an extraterrestrial, <laughs> because he came from a completely different dimension and he came to uh, this earth. Now, in that transition period, could he have shrunk? Could Allah have made him smaller? That's also a possibility. We're not disregarding that as a possibility, but there's no evidence of that from the Quran and Sunnah. So we can't say that that is what happened. Now, what we will say is this. Let's assume that Allah, he brought Adam down. He was 60 cubits, either in heaven and on earth or in heaven or on the earth. But let's just assume that he was on 60 cubits in heaven and on the earth. So when he came down, he was also 27, 27 meters. Which, by the way, now we're starting to make assumptions which we don't necessarily need to be uh, need to make. We can say, no, this he was like that height in heaven. But, uh, and when he came on the earth, he became normal height. Th that's something you can assume from the, from the source. But let's not assume that. Let's say he was uh, 27 meters on the earth. What's the problem? What's the problem? The problem are three different things now. Number one, biology. If we use the human anatomy that we have today as the reference point, if, if, the, uh, if the human anatomy today is the reference point, how could it be that something that tall, or a human being that tall, the bone structure can maintain that kind of size, right? Because it will collapse because of the weight of the human being. Well, this is a fallacy because we're not starting with the human being today as the reference point. We're starting with, why would you start with today's human being as a reference point? The reference point is that 27 uh, meter human being that we're talking about. That's the reference point. So if someone says, well, we know that if we keep doubling sizes, as I've even heard some, some Muslims try and say, keep doubling sizes and height, then the height will be so tall and then the weight will be so much and then the bones will not be able to handle that. Density of the bones will not be able to handle that. You're using your reference point uh, as the human anatomy of today, and then do qiyas backwards, which is a qiyas mal farq, if you like, or a false type of analogy. It's a different kind, it's false kind of analogy. So that's the first problem. You can say, oh, it's inconceivable that human anatomy can, can handle that size. Well, it's only inconceivable on the basis of an analyzing today's human anatomy. That's the first thing. The second thing we may say is someone could say, well, um, we talked about the biological problems, fossilization. How comes there is no fossil record of such a huge human? The National Science Foundation says that 99.9%, 99.9, 99.9% of species have not undergone fossilization. So fossilization, you expect to find one specimen uh, of a fossil, of a human that we don't know, tens or hundred thousand, whatever it is, years that he existed before. No way. This is like finding a needle in the haystack. It's ridiculous to expect to find fossils like this. It's, it's absolutely absurd. It's such a redundant, redundant interrogation. So that, that, that one would be put to the side. The third now interrogation is, well, how can we conceive of such a disparity between uh, humans 
within the, or any kind of animal within the same species like this. They say, we don't accept that. We don't accept that you can have a 27 meter human being and then you can have a six foot human being and that, that disparity existed and they say humans have been around for 350,000 years, which is, by the way, estimates we don't have to go with because they keep changing those, quite frankly. But let's just assume for the sake of argument. Are you saying to me, is my response, that you have, uh, there's no species within the species that exhibit this decrease in size, this dramatic exponential decrease in size? Because I can give you an example of the dwarf elephants, which the General Proceedings National Academy of Science shows the dwarf ele elephants were 220 pounds. They, they, they went down in 800,000 years, according to uh, the journal. In 800,000 years, they went down 100 times in size. So they were, uh, they were 100 times bigger than they were. They became dwarf elephants, 220 pounds, 100 kilos, which would mean that I'm bigger than those elephants, me personally, the one who's talking to you. On the, imagine an elephant that I can pick up or that you can pick up, and that would be heavier to pick me up than an elephant. I mean, this is just to give you some kind of visuals here. So if you can believe in an elephant that is that size, because you're looking at the fossil record and you're making your uh, evolutionarily, uh, evolution uh, inferences, then why can you not believe in a human being that's much bigger? That's just one of many examples, but within a very short time span in evolutionary terms. So why could not that happen to the human? <laughs> I mean, if you really want to believe it on your paradigm, why could not that happen to the human being? So it's okay when you say these things, but it's not okay when we say these things. You make a mockery out of the hadith, but the hadith makes the mockery out of you because this is actually what you believe in as well. And hopefully that answers the question. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Today, inshallah, we're going to be discussing a particular verse and actually there's more than one of them in the Quran which make these kinds of references, but we'll focus on one because the same thing that can be said of this verse can be said of all of the other ones which have similar phraseologies. And this is a verse in chapter number 55 of the Quran, verses 19 to 21, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Maraj al-Bahraini yaltaqiyan baynahuma barzakhun la yabaghiyan That he let free this, the two seas of Water and he put between them a barrier that you cannot tra transgress between. Now I recently saw, and I saw this before, a long time ago, a video of Richard Dawkins. Richard Dawkins actually going to a school with some Muslim students, some yeah, young students, and this is a common tactic. You go for the weak ones, the untrained ones, uh, you know, the, the, the students that they, they're not theologians, they're not learned, they still actually even haven't finished their GCSEs. And this is the kind of, uh, you know, engagements that Richard Dawkins and the rest of the New Atheist movement are used to doing with the Muslims. You, you get some weak one and you try and brainwash them uh, into your worldview. And he was, you know, talking um, to these uh, little girls uh, or these young uh, girls, and he was trying to persuade them that really he was, uh, that the Quran was wrong. He wasn't saying it in any explicit type of way, but he was being very pedantic. Maybe we can get a clip of this video and see what he has to, what he's, he's doing here. We learned about science and the Quran. By the end of the day, we all came to one conclusion that the Quran is evidence of science. So what science has proved to be um, just recently, is already proved in the Quran 1400 years ago when it was written. Uh, but that doesn't include evolution, apparently. No, it doesn't. Um, um, that, so what does it include? It includes stuff like the shape of the earth, um, about the, um, the mountains, how they secure the earth, and how um, in the sea, the two waters, they don't mix, the salty water and the drinking water, so it's um, pure for us to drink. They don't mix, but they pass through each other. Salty water and fresh water don't mix in the sea? No, it's like... Um, the barrier. I was shocked that RE elbows out science like this. Now, as you saw, this man was badgering the kids. Um, he doesn't want to go to train theologians, Muslim theologians, or uh, public figures, or whatever it may be. He's going for the children. And really, he's uh, arguing that this is false in the Quran. If, if the idea is that you have these, uh, the sweet water, the fresh water, and uh, the salty water, 
that there is a barrier between the, he's no such barrier exists. He said you can go to the kitchen. Yes, you can put the sweet, uh, you can put the, uh, you know, these two waters together and mix them and disprove the Quran. That's a, you know, this is such a weak and lazy approach. Don't you want to research what this verse is talking about in the first place? Because if you just went to even an English translation of the exegesis of such verses, you don't realize that the prominent or the most popular exegetical opinion on this was that the barrier in question were the land masses that were separating seas from rivers. For example, the Arabian Peninsula. For example, other land masses that separate these things. So on the one side of this land mass, you have maybe a sea and the other land, uh, side, you have a river and or the, or within the land, you have a river flowing. This is what is being referred to here, that God in his uh, greatness, is able to allow such different types of waters to exist within uh, the sphere of the earth. And this is, uh, what, what's wrong with that? What's, what's so unscientific about that? Why are you so lazy as to not go to a, a tafsir in English and check out that that was the primary exegetical uh, uh, method of understanding this verse? You see, and this is what happens. Uh, when you don't do your research. Yes, there are some scholars who say it's an invisible barrier and this has now gone to the scientific miracles narrative and so on. But we're not even going to go there. Some say it's, it's talking about air, estuaries and others say it's this and it's talking about... I'm not going there. This is enough for me to say that your shenanigans has been exposed. That you didn't even make an attempt. You didn't even make an attempt to try and understand the verse and read up some opinions on it. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Today, inshallah, we're going to be talking about a contention which is really a feeble and weak intention, uh, contention, sorry, which, like many of those, is really lazy academics at its best. It's the contention that says that the Quran mentions sperm but it does not mention ovum, and therefore the author, authorship of the Qur'an was unaware that such an ovum existed in the first place. Well, actually, the Qur'an doesn't mention spermatozoa. The word nutfa, which is sometimes translated as sperm drop. If you look at any of the ancient kind of linguistic um, dictionaries, it simply means qillatun min ma or a minute quantity of liquid or fluid. That's what it means. Now, some translators have translated this to mean spermatozoa, or, sp or not, not even that, sperm drop, or something like this. But that is us putting our own kind of 21st century glasses on and imposing it on the Quran. The Quran, even now, the Arabs, when they're talking about, when they're writing their kind of scientific textbooks about uh, sperm, they call it al haywan al-manawi. Okay, they, it's basically the animal which, a sperm animal, you know. This is how they would translate it because the word nutfa uh, is not specific enough to that very, you know, sperm that we see in, in diagrams, I'm sure you've seen uh, in pictures and so on, in films or whatever it may be. So the Quran doesn't mention that, nor does it mention uh, the egg. It doesn't mention the egg in its, because no one would understand this. I mean, think about the Quran is trying to reach out to a 7th century, 8th century, 9th century audience, not just a 21st century audience. Imagine if it's telling the end user here that uh, inside of the sperm that comes out or you emit as a man, uh, there is actually uh, animals in there. Or there, the people would be like, what, what's this talking about? I mean, think about that. The Quran uses phraseology which is appropriate for all peoples in all times. It uses perfect uh, phraseology, which we, as for example, 21st century um, end users of the Quranic uh, discourse, can understand, you know, with, with, for example, the biological and embryological understanding of today. But also that it couldn't alienate the 7th or 8th century or 9th century or 10th century people up until the age when the microscope was developed. This is uh, foolishness at its core, really, this assumption. So yes, it doesn't, doesn't mention the sperm in that sense, it doesn't mention the ovum in that sense, but the, the indications, to be quite honest with you, are all there that show that the authorship of Quran, of the Quran, or the author of the Quran was uh, acutely uh, aware. Like for example, Nutfatin Amshaj. 
نبتليه فجعلناه سميعا بصيرا as it says in Surah Al-Insan chapter number 76 verse number 2 we have created a human being from a mixture of fluids and we have made him seeing and hearing now what is this mixture? almost everybody agrees it's talking about the, the male and female uh, fluids combining now what fluids are we talking about? the entirety of it because we know it only requires one cell from each and this is also indicated in the hadith of the Prophet Muhammad where it says, "Laysa al-waladu min al-ma'i kullihi." Or, "Kama qala صلى الله عليه وسلم," that the born child is not from the entirety of the fluid. So, Subhanallah, even this. So, you have this nufa amshaj, you have this um, mixture between the male and female fluids, which we know uh, uh, it happens in fertilization, but it's only a part of this entirety of thing which creates the fertilization. What's fascinating is that the sperm and the ovum and the egg are all contained within a fluid uh, and this is uh, beautifully elaborated with the one who says I've been given the brief and decisive speech who is the Prophet Muhammad who said that it's not from the entirety of this liquid but it's actually from a uh, part of it so this it seems to me that is the author of the Quran and the, uh, the, the, the Sunnah as well was aware was aware of these, uh, the minutiae uh, related to the, these things. And I think this is really a shot in the foot for those uh, detractors, because the more we look at your evidences, the more we realize the beauty and the precision of the Quranic discourse. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Today, inshallah, we're going to be speaking about a very fruitless and frivolous and capricious claim a weak claim, a ridiculous contention uh, of the highest order, really. Um, a claim that says that the Quran says in chapter number 51, verse number 49, that everything was created in pairs. <laughs> And we know of such a thing as asexual reproduction, and therefore this is false. So, I don't know whether to stop, roll my eyes, or even try and dignify this uh, thing with the, re uh, with the response. But maybe I should, for the, for the satisfaction of those who are a little bit curious. Really and truly, we've said this more than once, the word kul does not necessarily mean every single thing with the exclusion of nothing in the genus. This is something which we know from the usage of the word kul, which is also used in the Quran. Well, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions in Surah Al-Ahqaf, chapter 46, verse number 25, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, تُدَمِّرُ كُلَّ شَيْءٍ بِأَمْرِ رَبِّهَا فَأَصْبَحُوا لَا يُرَى إِلَّا مَسَاكِنُهُمْ that it destroys, there's a wind that destroys everything uh, with the command of its Lord. So they came to be uh, not seen except for their indwellings. And of course, uh, this does not mean that this wind that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is talking about is a wind that destroyed everything, including animals and the earth and the cosmos, even though there's the exception there. Uh, except for their indwellings. It doesn't mean everything was destroyed except for the indwellings. So the uh, kul here is not intended by any means or any stretch of the imagination to mean every single thing on the face of the earth, let alone the entire existence or entire universe. This is impossible to extrapolate from this verse. And that is why many of the scholars have actually written books and treatises about this word kul because many people that employ literalistic understandings of uh, the Arabic language do not understand these kinds of usages. So Siyulti wrote a book, Al Kul wa Ma Alayhi Tadul, or the word kul and what it implies or what it uh, evidences or shows. Now, is it talking about animals? Uh, it doesn't say animals in this verse, <clears throat> but it doesn't mean just animals, because if you look at some of the exegesis of the past, even of 
uh, great uh, scholars like Al Hassan al Basri and others. And even if you look at Tabari, what he says, they don't restrict this to just meaning male and female. For example, they say, a zoj is anything and its opposite. So, for example, if you have night, then the opposite will be the day. If you have heaven, the opposite will be the earth, for example, you know, from our perspective, before someone jumps and says, no, this is, just calm down. We're talking about the anthropocentric perspective. Otherwise, it's all meaningless. We're nothing in the universe anyway. So, here again, this is a flatly weak and false uh, contention, putting into the Quran what they wish was in there and is not in there. So simply to answer this question, the word kul doesn't mean every single thing, and it's not restricted to male and female uh, uh, distinctions. It could be in anything and its opposite, quite frankly, and this is facilitated in the language and understood by the classical exegetes of the time. And I hope this answers the question. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Today, inshallah, we're going to be tackling and dealing with a contention, a misconception, a misnomer, really, uh, that some of the anti-Islamic apologists use in order to further their case. And this is a very common one that's been circulating maybe the internet for some time. And really, it's a contention that says that the Quran gets it wrong when it says that the bones form before flesh. When in Surah Al-Hajj and Surah Al-Mu'minun, the... Um, Chapter 22 and chapter 23, respectively, of the Quran, they detail the stages of embryolog embryological development or embryonic development. When these two surahs do so, the mistake they say in the, uh, the, the chronology is that the bones are mentioned before the um, flesh. <laughs> And they say this is something which is problematic. Now, first of all, let's take a look at what the, the latest cutting edge uh, you know, kind of research is saying on this. I'm going to read this from directly because this is not my area of specialism. So I'm just going to be uh, doing istiana or using this book, which is the Fundamentals of Human Embryology by John Allen and Beverly Kramer, to inform the discussion today. Let's start off with what they say about the development of limb, uh, limb uh, musculature. It says for many years, and it's very interesting because science, as we always say, is a transient and dynamic and developing thing. And so when maybe 20 or 30 years ago, they were using these kinds of uh, interrogations against the Quran, the fact that science has developed, okay, actually shows us that we have to be a bit careful making uh, judgments about the Quran using science, either positively or negatively, because listen to what they say. Uh, she, she says, or he says, because we don't know who's writing it here, um, for many years it was believed that limb muscles differentiated in situ from uh, limb mesenchy mesenchyme. It is now known that myogenic cells invade the limb buds from the somites at the roots of the buds. However, it seems that tendons and other connective uh, tissue elements of the muscles are formed in situ from the limb bud uh, mesenchyme. Now, the mesenchyme is not yet actualized or it's not really developed into one of the three main types of cell which would either form a skin, bone or muscle. But this, the point of uh, importance here is, is this particular thing. And this is very important here. Soon after the cartilaginous models of the bones have been established, the myogenic cells, which have now become myoblasts, aggregate to form uh, muscle masses on the ventral and dorsal aspects of the limbs. These muscle masses in the relevant compartments form the flexors and extenders of the joints. Rotator muscles are also formed so that flexors and pronators are related and extens extensors and uh, supinators are related. Now, basically in lay language, which people like me are more in need of than I'm, I'm pretty sure are informed and educated audiences, uh, what we're talking about when they say myoblast, sorry, myogenic cells. So the myogenic cells would eventually become muscle tissue, okay? So what is being said here is that you've got these cartilaginous models, right? And the cartilaginous models would eventually become ossified through a process of os uh, osteogenesis or ossification, which actually continues until puberty. And this uh, basically forms the bone, it becomes 
um, uh, ossified. So these uh, cartilaginous zones, basically you have these myogenic cells coming now, forming over the cartilaginous zones. Now what are the cartilaginous zones or models? They basically form what would then become muscles after the process of uh, sorry bones after the process of ossification. Now the question is, can cartilage in the Arabic language be used to describe bone, or am, are bone a type of sorry are, 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 is cartilage a type of bone in the Arabic language? Because if it is, then the whole issue from a scientific perspective ha, become, becomes a non-issue straight away. And the answer is yes. The answer is the word rodruf in the Arabic language, which means cartilage. The word Rudruf in the Arabic language, which means cartilage, according to Fayruz Abadi in his book, in his dictionary, and of course, Lesan al-Arab, which is one of the pr premier gold standard, you know, reference points as a, from a dictionary perspective on the Arabic language. And when they des describe Rudruf, it says, you know, Avm uh, layin or something like this, or basically, it is bone which is very smooth. In other words, cartilage is a type of bone in the Arabic language. So could it be the case, could it be the case, that this verse is talking about this process of the myogenic cells migrating uh, to the cartilaginous models? Yes, it could very well be, and if it is, the entire contention is completely uh, solved. But of course, does it mean, does it have to say fakasona al-aidham al-lahma? Does this fakasona al-aidham al-lahma necessarily entail taqib or chronology or sequentialism? The answer is not really. It could be conceived that the fa here is not necessarily chronological. And uh, we can bring uh, evidences all over the Quran and Sunnah to uh, evidence this case. But suffice it for me to say that that is not necessary at this juncture, since the whole issue has become a non-issue according to the current scientific information that we have. But no, definitely, it could be that the fat is not the taqib, it could be. And also you have to remember one other thing, that is, it says فَكَسَوْنَ الْعِظَامَ lahma. It doesn't say فَخَلَقَنَ الْعِظَامَ lahma. It says we have clothed the idam with meat or with flesh. It doesn't say that we have, yes, uh, created the flesh. In other words, it may be the case, it may be the case that the meat or the flesh, whatever you want to call it, that it was already there, but it was rearranged because al kisu is different from al-khalq. So clothing something is different from it being created, especially from non-emergent properties. Or in other words, coming from non-emergence. There's a difference between those two things. And in fact, al-Baydawi says something very interesting in his tafsir, who is an early uh, mufassir. He talks about the stage which is referred to in Surah Al-Hajj as mukhallaqa or ghir mukhallaqa. He talks about when it's formed and unformed, the mudra, which is uh, another really, really interesting descri description because mudra, is literally means something which is chewed, a chewed-like flesh or chewed-like thing. And this is what the, the dictionaries, all the dictionaries uh, will say to the Arabic dictionaries. So mudra really, mudra really uh, could be very well corresponding with what is referred to today in embryology as somatogenesis. The somites being formed on the, uh, in the, on the embryo. And the fact that this is or ghir mukhallaqa could be talking about the cells migrating in different ways and operating or operationalizing and functioning in different ways. This is muhtamal, very possible. But it suffice it for me to say once again that if we accept the premise that the cartilaginous models or zones which have not been fully ossified and will not be fully ossified by the way, because this is the assumption of the, uh, the attack, are sufficient to be named as Aidam in the Quran, then according to the latest science that we have, this becomes a non-issue straight away. And hopefully that answers the question. Wassalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Today, inshallah, we're going to be talking about one of the most spurious and specious claims that I've actually ever seen against Islam, that it beggars belief that people are actually using this as an argument against Islam. It's such a blow to the credibility of those individuals that they are making arguments so desperate and so pathetic as this. What is the argument that we're talking about? So this is one of the arguments. They say that the Quran says that there's thamaniya to azwaj, that there are eight types of azwaj or pairs, and with that it's talking about the an'am, and that there are four types of an'am. An'am is loosely translated as cattle. <coughs> and the Quran says, you know, min al, min al that from the, uh, from the sheep there are two pairs, and from the ma'az, the goats, there are two pairs, and from the baqar ithnain, from the cows, there are two pairs, and from the ibl ithnain, and from the camels, there are two pairs. And they say, look, 
This is from what I've understood from their contention because it's so pathetic that it actually beggars once again belief. If you take, for example, the Collins dictionary definition of the word cattle, what I've seen is that it says, for example, bovid mammals of the tribe of uh, bovines, especially those of genus Bos. And then you go to bovin, uh, bovid, and potentially, this is what they're referring to here, that it can relate to a family of hollow horned mammals, including sheep, goats, cattle, antelopes, and buffalo. So my understanding of their contention is that they're saying that the word an'am is rich or cattle, loosely defined or translated, uh, is limited in the Quranic paradigm where it should be more expansive. Now the question is this, why should we accept this definition? If this is the definition you want us to accept. This is clearly a case of the fallacy of equivocation. You're, you, you're forcing one language into another language paradigm. This is ridiculous behavior. And in fact, it, it actually assures me that you people, anti-Islamic apologists, have no understanding at all of the Arabic language and that you're relying heavily, if not entirely, on translations. Because if you just looked at Tafsir al-Tabari of chapter number 16, verse number 5, and he mentions what the word an'am means, he mentions that it means those four things. The word an'am itself means those four things. The sheep and goats and cows and camels. You can do better than this. This is embarrassing. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Today, inshallah, we're going to be talking about a verse which is uh, littered all over these kind of anti-Islamic websites. This is in chapter 86, verse number 7, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says, فَلْيَنْظُرِ الْإِنسَانِ مِنْ مَا خُلِقْ خُلِقَ مِنْ مَا إِنْ دَافِقْ يَخْرُجُ مِنْ بَيْنِ الصُّلْبِ وَالْتَرَائِبِ That let human beings see where he has uh, been, uh, from what he has been created. He has been created from a secreted or a gushing fluid that comes from or that he comes from, and we'll talk about the differences in translation, between the backbone and the ribs. And obviously here, sulbu taraib is translated in more than one way, and we'll come to this. The contention is that this is actually unscientific because we know that spermiogenesis uh, happens in the testicles and it doesn't happen between the backbones and the ribs, for example. And the assumption, obviously, is that what is being referred to in the verse when it says ma in dafiq is sperm and therefore this verse is out of line with observable reality and it's a proof against islam this is the this is the contention so let's deal with one thing at a time first and foremost does the word what does the words sulba and taraib actually mean so there are three opinions which are represented in the classical literature and the dictionaries Either we're talking about the backbone and the ribs of the man, or we're talking about the backbones of the ribs and the uh, backbones of the man and the ribs of the woman, or we're talking about the backbone and the ribs of the woman, and we're not talking about the secreted uh, liquid or the secreted fluid, but instead we're talking about the insan, the human being himself. Because the verse says, فَلْيَنْظُرِ insan مَا let the human being see from which, or from that which he has been created, خُلِقَ مِنْ مَا إِنْ He has been created from a gushing or secreted fluid, يَخْرُجُ مِنْ بَيْنِ السُّلْبِ وَالْتَرَائِبِ Which comes from between the backbone and the ribs. Now, could it mean that the human being, يعني فَلْيَنْظُرُ الْإِنسَانْ مِمَّا خُلِقْ Let the human being see which, where he has been created from, خُلِقَ مِنْ مَا إِنْ دَافِقْ And تَقْدِيرْ here is, خُلِقَ الْإِنسَانِ مِنْ مَا إِنْ دَافِقْ The insan was created from مَا إِنْ دَافِقْ Secreted fluid يَخْرُجُ مِنْ بَيْنِ يَخْرُجُ الْإِنسَانِ يعني مِنْ بَيْنِ الصُّلْبِ وَالْتَرَائِبْ That the insan, it comes from بَيْنِ الصُّلْبِ وَالْتَرَائِبْ So the, the opinion that says the classical apologetical approach or apologetics approach for those who take the view that it's talking about مِنْ بَيْنِ الصُّلْبِ وَالْتَرَائِبْ The backbone and the ribs of the man is to say well actually this is saying مَا إِنْ دَافِق is saying secreted fluid, it's talking about gushing fluid. And we know that, yes, spermiogenesis happens in the testes, but it goes up the epididymis. And um, actually, there is something called seminal vesicle, and it collects seminal fluids from there, and it comes back down the urethra. And then when ejaculation happens, what, what then takes place is obviously 
the emission happens. And so the, the seminal fluids, right, the seminal fluids are collected from either the seminal vesicles and or the prostate. That's opinion one. So they say that Bain sulbi wa taraib here is anything above the coccyx and what's parallel to it. Because the coccyx or ajb al-dhanab in the Arabic language is where the b- backbone ends. Bain sulbi the wa taraib between the uh, the backbone and the ribs, so that the backbone ends at the aj- ajb or the coccyx. So every part of the intersection there. And that means to say from a human reproductive perspective that anything which is above the penis, because the penis is parallel to, from an anatomical perspective, to the coccyx. And we know that the seminal vesicles and uh, we know that also the prostate is above the penis. And so they say this is, uh, in fact, Morris Bukwa uh, in his famously said, this is a scientific miracle of the Quran. But we're not going down that route. We're just saying this is one apologetic approach of answering the question. And it may be satisfactory to some, it may not be satisfactory to others. And the language actually is facilitative of that. Now, the second uh, approach where we say that it's talking about the backbone of the man and the ribs of the woman, they say this is talking about uogenesis. Because uogenesis happens in the ovaries of the woman and uh, this is where the eggs are basically being formed and so that happens above the once again the vagina which is parallel to the coccyx and so the the same kind of argument is made and they say so this is talking about the fluids because there's a fluid that carries uh, either the egg or the sperm for both man and woman and so they say this is not talking about, because the Arabic word nutfa is not used here. Nutfa is categorized as qillatun bin ma', a minute quantity of liquid. But the, the phraseology used here is ma' in dafiq, a gushing secreted fluid. So that someone would notice the differentiation between the two kinds of uh, words that are used. That's the first thing that, that is said. So yes, this is one approach, the other approach. But one other approach which has not been highlighted as much, which also has classical precedent, and is mentioned uh, by uh, Ibn Atiyah in his tafsir, and also by Al-Qurtubi in his, as one of the one of two main opinions that he mentions in this verse, is that this is not talking about the secreted fluid at all. It's talking about the insan. Because it says, فَلْيَنْظُرِ insan مِمَّا خُلِقَ Let the human being see what he was created from. خُلِقَ مِمَّا اِنْدَافَقْ يعني خُلِقَ الْإِنسَانِ مِمَّا اِنْدَافَقْ The human being was created from a secreted fluid. يَخْرُجُ مِنْ بَيْنِ الصُّلْبِ وَالْتَرَائِبِ He says, تَقْدِيرُهُ What is understood in the language here, in the subtext, is that يَخْرُجُ الْإِنسَانِ مِمْ بَيْنِ الصُّلْبِ وَالْتَرَائِبِ That the human being is, comes from بَيْنِ الصُّلْبِ وَالْتَرَائِبِ And this is talking about pregnancy and birth. And this would be co- completely uncontroversial because obviously the baby is in the end intersection between the backbone and the ribs of the woman. And so these are three very legitimate ways to, to answer the question and three very uh, acceptable things. No one can really, especially with the third opinion, I see no way. I see no way. Anyone can say that's against observable reality. And therefore to try and use this verse to indicate that only sperm which, by the way, the, the word sperm is not mentioned in the scientific senses in the Quran, the haywan al manawi which the Arabs have now invented and put into biological textbooks, is, is created between the backbones and, and the ribs. This is ignorance, and it's not a comprehensive understanding of the Quranic discourse. Wassalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Today, inshallah, we're going to be refuting, debunking, confuting, and rejecting a claim that is made by the anti-Muslim or anti-Islamic apologists, which is actually quite a weak, weaker than a spider's web type of claim, which is, uh, they say that the sky or the heaven or the universe is presented in the Islamic cosmology, in the Quran in particular, as a solid object. And they, to, in order to kind of strengthen their case, refer to two different verses of the Qur'an. One that is mentioned in chapter number 22, verse number 65, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that he holds a samawat wal ard and taqa'ala al ard. That he holds the heavens and the earth. Uh, sorry, wa yumsik as sama and taqa'ala al ard. That he holds the heaven that it falls on the earth. Uh, and they say, look at this. It's, uh, in order for that to be the case, uh, the you know the heaven has to be a solid object, and therefore the presentation of the Quran is that the heaven 
is a solid object. And the other verse that they mention is in chapter number two, uh, chapter number uh, 35, verse number 41, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says uh, that he, السماوات الأرض أن تزولا that he holds the heavens and the earth that they would fall out of their place or they would come out of their place or that they would be moved out of their place. Zawal, means zawal, yani from, from the word zala yuzilu means like zawal, something to be moved out of its place or to move, move away in general. So these are the two verses that they do istishad with or they try and evidence to suggest that the Quran's picture, the cosmological picture is one which is uh, that the heaven or the universe is a solid object. Now, this is uh, false for two reasons. And the second of which I think really is an undercutter, by the way. Um, so I don't want to hear this again. I mean, uh, only an embarrassed person after hearing the second of my sec of two or three points I'm going to make would dare to challenge this point. It's just so embarrassing, to be honest. The first point is this. Sometimes Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, uh, when he refers to something as a whole, he can refer to a part, meaning the whole. And this is part of the kind of phraseological, myriological, um, terminological usages of the Quran. So myriology is the parts of whole and uh, uh, holes and parts. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, for example, in the Quran says, he mentions in Surah An-Nuh, chapter 71, that the people of Noah, that they put their asabi'ahum fi adhanihim, that they put their fingers in their ears. Now really, did they put the entire, look at the size of the finger. You put the entire, it's impossible really to put the entire finger in the ear. So what is being intended here is the banan, the, the, the anamil, the anamil, the, the fingertip, and you put it in the ear. But here you see, the fingertip, which are referred to in Arabic as anamil, are not, this is not, yaj'alun anamilahum, he didn't say that. He said they put their asabi'ahum. Even though the enamel, the fingertip is that which is there. Likewise now with this, when Allah says, يُمْسِكَ sama, it doesn't necessarily have to mean everything in the uh, heaven. It could mean, as Tahir ibn Ashur, he says, in his tafsir, that it's referring to certain things, like meteor, it's referring to snow, which comes from above and below, it's referring to rain, it's referring to this, referring to that. All of these things that are above us can, can do suqut al-ad, can, from our anthropological, phenomenological perspective, fall on us. Yes, what's the problem? And this is a linguistically acceptable for the reasons aforementioned, understanding of the verse. But let's move a little bit further. If really, and this is the undercutter here, so wait for it, wait for it. If really <laughs> the Quran's picture of the heaven, the sama, is that of a solid object, my question to you is this. How could the Prophet Muhammad do Isra al Ma'raj through a solid object? <laughs> See how embarrassing that must I mean, as I say this to you now, how embarrassed do you feel as the anti Islamic apologists? Very embarrassing, isn't it? And the Quran even says, it's mentioned in chapter number six. You know, verse 125, he even says, he's talking about, whoever Allah wants to misguide, he makes his chest constrained, it's as if he is uh, ascending in the heaven. How is this ka'annama conceivable if the, if the heaven is a solid object? I rest my case, ladies and gentlemen. Wallahi, I rest it. I rest my case, yani, sorry to say. This should never be heard again now. It's so embarrassing. They are saying that the Quran says that the heaven is a solid object when one of the most uh, uh, central things in the Prophet's seerah biography is that he done Isra uh, and Ma he done Isra and Ma'raj. He went up the heaven. Uh, he, how can you go up the heaven when it's a solid object? Come on, please. Uh, really, really. These people do not employ critical reasoning when they're uh, dealing with the Quran. Now, another ishkal that someone, a problematized thing that someone can say is that how come now, if we take it on face value and we're not saying it's a part of the heaven that falls, can we still understand it to mean that the heaven is some kind of the fabric of space is going to implode upon itself or is going to create a black hole or something like that and that it would appear to us as if it's falling if that is the case? Allah alam, God knows best. The kafir or the howness of how such um, how such a thing would take place and how it would look from our perspective if it was in its, for example, initial phases or if it was in its end phases is something we cannot speculate on. But we should remember that Allah, when He's speaking to the human being, He is speaking to him in His own anthropo uh, anthropo uh, uh, anthropocentric phenomenological perspective and that means from his, his perspective is from his 
perspective. And I, I rest my case. I don't think there's anything more to be said about this. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Today, inshallah, we're going to be talking about a hadith which is uh, all over the anti-Islamic uh, apologetics type websites and is in their publications and their videos online, which is a hadith which says that the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, مَن تَصَبَّحَ بِسَبْعَ تَمَرَاتْ عَجْوَةً لَا يَضُرُّهُ سُمْمٌ وَلَا سِحْرًا That whoever wakes up and consumes seven dates of ajwa kind, that poison will not afflict him, and sihr, which is magic, will not afflict him. And they say this is an unscientific type of hadith, because they say, how could it be the case when the chemical agents or properties within the, within the dates, there's nothing within them that would indicate to us from a scientific perspective that they could be um, uh, immunizing to things uh, as, as, as chemically destructive as uh, poison. So why, how can you understand this hadith and this, doesn't this hadith fly in the face of 21st century scientific discovery? Now first, in order to answer this question, let's take a look at what some of the commentators of this hadith of all time have mentioned. So for example, Al-Khattabi, who is a scholar of the 4th century, died 388 AH, he says actually it's not because of a specific property within the date. He says this, there's nothing within the date that actually has that immunizing capacity. He says, Lali Khasiya Fitamr. It's not because of a specific characteristic or attribute in the day. Well, Innama is because of the da'wah of the Prophet Muhammad or the, the blessings of the da'wah of the Prophet Muhammad And many of the scholars have, uh, have looked at this hadith in this kind of way. Ibn Qayyim said, no, it's for a, spe a special time and a special place and it's not applicable to us. Uh, Al-Qurtubi said it can only be seen to be applicable to us if it goes through the experimental method and succeeds in the sense that we can actually prove that the dates are in fact in line, uh, immunizing to poison. And this shows us that the, the, the commentators of hadith had a very sober approach to science and hadith and science and Quran. They understood that sometimes these are two separate areas of uh, jurisdiction, if you like, and sometimes they have an overlap. Now, before we continue with this hadith, the opinion of Al-Khattabi, which says it's not a specific property in the date, seems to be well represented if we look at other hadiths, because there's another hadith which the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, he told us in the what you call the evening supplications of Al-Athkar al-Masa, uh, which we should all be making, by the way, Athkar al-Sabah al-Masa, beautiful supplications we should be making in the morning and the evening that will, will cause protection for us and so on. One of these words of protection is, uh, is, أعوذ بكلمات الله التامات من شر ما خلق That I seek refuge with the perfect words of God from the evil from which he created. And the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said about this, he said, whoever says this, لم يضره شيء. He said that whoever says this, nothing will afflict him or no harm will afflict him. Now wait a minute. If the date hadith was intended to be an immunization a physical or chemical immunization, then how comes we find similar or even more generic, even more generic types of terminology used in other hadith? If you think about this, this cannot mean it's a physical thing because this is a supplication which doesn't necessitate any consumption of anything physical at all. So this hadith of the dates, from that perspective, it follows that it wouldn't be because of the properties of the date, but it's because of the ibadah or the worship of doing eating seven dates. So it's a worship, just like drinking zamzam water is a, is a worship, just like doing wudu is a worship, just like making dua is a worship. And yes, we believe if you do that particular worship, Allah will protect you. Yes, from sum, from poison, and yes, from sihr. Yes, He will, unless. There is a mana, and, and the mawana or the preventers can be many. Like for example, to give you an example, there is a hadith which says that if you make dua, if you supplicate to God, but then your actions, your income, and your consumption is all haram, it's all impermissible, then how can it be that your supplication will be accepted? Even though the Quran says, فَإِذَا سَأَلَكَ عِبَادِي عَنِّي فَإِنِّي قَرِيبٌ أُجِيبُ دَعْوَةَ الدَّاعِ إِذَا دَعَانِ 
that if my slave asks me about me, then say I am near, then I am near. I answer the call of the caller when he calls. So Allah is telling us he's going to answer a dua, but in other parts of the sunnah and the Quran, he indicates to us that actually there are mawana to dua, which are, for example, if you have haram income, if you have haram, if you commit sins and so on and so forth. Thus, the same kind of principle can be understood with this hadith of the dates, which is that in general, yes, you eat the seven dates and yes, you will be uh, protected and immunized from these things by Allah's will, so long as there's no mana, so long as there's no preventer, in much the same way as you ask Allah for whatever you like, so long as it's halal and it's not doing haram, and Allah will answer you so long as there's no mana, there's no preventer, and that's impossible to disprove from a scientific perspective, and I hope that answers the question. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Today, inshallah, we're going to be talking about one of the most specious claims that has come out of this science, narrative, science error narrative, which is this claim that there's a hadith of the Prophet, which supposedly says that the earth is on the back of a whale, and the whale is on the back of a, is balancing on some kind of a rock or something to this effect. And this hadith is fabricated. I mean, I don't want to waste too much time with this video, and just to be honest with you, this hadith is absolutely weak, weak in its sanad, its chain, and weak in its content, it's uh, what it's saying. I mean, if you look at the Sanad, let's start with that, the chain of narration, we'll know that uh, it has in it Abdullah bin Wahab, it has in it Abdullah bin Ayyash, it has in it the Rajim bin Sam'an, it has in it Abdullah ibn uh, Sulaiman al-Tawil, and all of those individuals, all of them, without exception, are weak narrators. And in fact, Ibn Kathir mentions in his Buday al Nihaya, the beginning and the end, that this is a fabrication that is taken from the Isra'iliyat, from the uh, kind of tales of the uh, Judeo-Christian uh, tradition, or those individuals from that tradition. So this is something which is absolutely fabricated, it's weak in, in chain, it's, it's weak in narration, it's weak in content. Because no doubt this is some kind of a mythological hadith. But why can't you find something like this in the Quran? This is really interesting. I mean, it's so easy for everybody, I think, uh, that, that accesses this kind of hadith to know that this is absolutely unscientific and whatever you want to say about this, uh, you can't really, it's indefensible, really, this, the, the metan, the content of this hadith. And why can't we find something like that? So glaringly, obviously, against the observable reality in the Quran and the authentic sunnah. Why do people have to resort to getting something which is fabricated in order to make a case against Islam? Do you think, and this is another issue, when you look at one of the compendious uh, exegetical works of the Tabari and other individuals, where they actually intentionally put all the material in there, including the weak and fabricated material, so that the scholar who is trained and able to distinguish between the weak and the fabricated narrations on the one hand, the matruq, the mawdu'a, the da'if, and so on, these kinds of varying levels of inauthenticity, and they also put in there the authentic hadith, do you think that as an unqualified personnel that you are, the detractor of Islam coming into some tafsir, just because it's narrated from that tafsir, that has somehow become authentic? No. This is not how it works. And this is why the, when the untrained hand reaches into the scholarly works of the Muslims, this is the kind of blunders that they make. But in fact, what they show is that they have to resort, desperately resort, to, to these kind of fabricated narrations that nobody uh, accepts as absolutely embarrassing narration. But why can't you find something so glaringly against the observable reality as this? There's nothing that you'll find in the Quran, and once again, the authentic sunnah that is like that. But nice try. No cigar this time. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Today, inshallah, we're going to be talking about a contention, a misconception, a misnomer, something which you'll find in some of the anti-Islamic websites or in anti-Muslim or anti-Islamic apologetics. They claim that, look, your religion, they say, is a religion which says that you have to go and drink the urine of camels and the milk and urine of camels. What kind of medieval practice is this? We have come a long way in by way of pharmacology and medicine. And look, your religion wants to bring us back. Your religion wants to bring us back to the dark ages. This is what they claim, but is this a true claim? And what are they basing this claim on? They're basing this claim on a hadith in Sahih Bukhari where some individuals came to the Prophet Muhammad um, having some kind of a disease. 
and complaining of severe pain and torment from that disease. And they came to him and he advised them to go and drink the camel, the urine of the camel and drink the milk of the camel. Now, one might argue that this is completely, you know, unscientific. And it's, why would he do such a thing? Why would the Prophet Muhammad do such a thing? Is there any kind of scientific backing for this at all? Well, first and foremost, we need to understand that this hadith is not am, it's khas. It's not uh, general, but specific. It was specific to those people in that time, in that place. I mean, if the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was uh, in this time, in the 21st century, I'm pretty certain that he would have referred those individuals to the hospitals or to the pharmacies. But you have to remember that this was situation specific. So those individuals that came there, the question is, what might they have had? What kind of conditions might they have had? No, we can speculate. We can say that they might have had edema or some kind of fluid buildup in the stomach and in the liver. We can, we can make those things because camel urine is rich in potassium, potassium um, and it's also rich in uh, albumin. And quite frankly, urine is something which we find in some medication. I mean, uh, Premarin is a medication which takes in, uh, which takes in as part of its... Uh, uh, one of the components of this medication is the uh, urine of mare, pregnant mare, actually pregnant mare urine. So this is not a foreign concept of using urine for medication, it's even today in the 21st century. But it's not to say that we as Muslims, when we're not suffering from anything, and we have all of the facilitation by way of medical advancement in the 21st century, should be going and drinking camel urine and going to drink uh, the urine, uh, sorry, the milk of the camel as a way to try and uh, alleviate our illnesses. And the evidence of this is so, is so clear in the Qur'an. Go and ask the people of specialism if you don't know, the Qur'an says, thereby giving authority to doctors. The Prophet Muhammad tells us to go to those reputable doctors. And he even says those, مَن تَطَبَّبَ وَلَمْ يَكُمْ بِالطِبِّ مَعْرُوفًا Whoever uh, tries to be a doctor and is not someone who is known in medicine, or as a practitioner of medicine, and, he's, and he harms somebody or kills someone, then he will be uh, punished for so doing. So there is clear direction, redirection from the Islamic uh, paradigm of, move, of, of going to those specialists, those medical specialists for our needs. So no, this is not a, a general uh, uh, kind of directive from the Prophet or prescription of the Prophet. In fact, even the medieval scholars like Ibn al-Qayyim al jawziyah make this very clear in their tracts in their kutub, in their books, about the prophetic medicine and so on and so forth. This is a specific kind of remedy for a specific kind of people in a specific kind of context. And yes, we can try and speculate as to what these individuals may have had and what that prescription, that so-called, if you want to pull it in this way, prescription would have had uh, in, by way of relieving effect to those individuals. So really, there's, there's, no, there, there's no way you can go in this criticism, because what can you say? That potassium and albumin and or calcium, whatever it is, in the cocktail of prescriptions that the Prophet ﷺ told those individuals would have had no relieving effect for absolutely any disease that can uh, come in. You can't make that claim, unfortunately. You'd have to be making that claim. You'd have to say, for you to have a kind of valid scientific argument here, if you want to call it that, you'd have to say that this cocktail of prescriptions that the Prophet gave to those individuals would have been useless in any disease that those individuals would have had. And that's an impossible claim because we know that there are nutrients. They're nutrient-rich, those things, that cocktail of uh, things that we've just talked about, the camel urine and the milk. It has potassium and albumin and other things. So, unless you want to be brave enough to make a claim like that, which can be easily refuted, and has been, really, if you think about what I've just said, then I would say, stop being immature. If urine is part of uh, the drugs that we take consume in the 21st century. This is not a way of disproving the prophethood of Prophet Muhammad Really, what this is, is a cheap way of trying to mock the religion of Islam and the prophet of Islam. But the joke is on you. Oh, detractor, because the, the, tr the truth of the matter, the reality of the situation is that the Prophet and Islam gives us clear directives to go to those who are specialists in the field, including, of course, medical professionals. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Today, inshallah, we're going to be discussing the issue of geocentrism in the Quran, or the supposed geocentrism that the retractors had supposedly found in the Quran, all over the verses in the Quran that is so glaringly obvious for us that we have not been able to detect it. But let's take a look at this claim and see how honest it is, whether it's actually eisegetical or exegetical in nature. 
What is the claim? The, the claim is that in the Quran, in those verses where the orbits of the sun and the moon are mentioned, that this indicates to us, at least uh, it implies to us, maybe in implicit reference or inference, that the sun is going around the earth. This is their claim. So what kind of verses do they use? Before I get to what kind of verses they use, we should point to the fact that we've done an entire video on the hadith of prostration of Abu Dhar al-Ghafari and this can be found in the description box below. And you should be looking at inshallah also if you have your time, uh, all the other videos we've done in this series because potentially we have other answers because a lot of these videos are actually intertwined in terms of the themes and content of these videos. So let's move on and talk about where in fact they're talking about this, uh, these um, geocentric references in the Quran. So they'll, they'll mention, for example, chapter number 39, verse number 5. He rolls the day into the night, and he rolls the night into the day, and he has made the sun move subservient for you, and each of them are running in an orbit. So does this mean to say, from this verse, or other verses, but let's go with this verse first, that the sun is going around the, the earth? No, there is no such indication at all. The only way, in this verse, and we'll see in other verses that they quote, that you can come to the conclusion that is saying that the sun is going around the earth is if you impose, you superimpose that understanding, you have already had a preconceived understanding of geocentrism in the Quran and now you are trying to force that interpretation onto the Quran. You will not find, quite frankly, you will not find, quite frankly, any verse in the Quran which simply states the sun goes around the earth. And how easy would it have been for such a verse to be there? Look at Surah Al-Shams, Surah Al-Shams, chapter number 91 of the Quran. وَالشَّمْسِ وَضُحَاهَا وَالْقَمْرِ إِذَا تَلَاهَا وَالنَّهَارِ إِذَا جَلَّاهَا وَالْلَيْلِ إِذَا يَخْشَاهَا The sun, and as it illuminates the day, or the, 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 the rays of the light. وَالشَّمْسِ وَضُحَاهَا وَالْقَمْرِ إِذَا تَلَاهَا And as the moon follows the sun. Now, does this mean it's following in a, in a geocentric orbit? No, it doesn't have to mean that, because in Islamic cosmology, we know that the, the day follows the night, and the night follows the day, and that's the anthropocentric ph phenomenological perspective. We see that the night, th these are sequences that we see from our perspective. But actually, quite frankly, the sun, the moon does actually follow the sun. I mean, a lot of these individuals have not even touched, have not even touched the basics of cosmology. Uh, I mean, I don't, I don't, it's very surprising that they're making all these scientific claims and they don't realize that the sun is not just stationary, it's revolving around its own axis and it's running through the fabric of space, taking with it all of those planets that are around it and of course all the moons that exist within the solar system as well. So in, in, in reality, the, the, the moon is actually following the sun and also from our perspective, the moon is following the sun. Look at the beauty and the brevity and the conciseness of the Quranic expression, such that an individual doesn't have to do uh, hermeneutical acrobatics or hermeneutical gymnastics in order to come to a conclusion like this. So we're not trying to force things into the book. They also mention chapter number 21, verse number 33, where it says that, وَكُلُمْ فِي فَلَكٍ يَسْبَحُونَ The sun and the moon, it says that all of it is in a felak. يَسْبَحُونَ But that's true. The sun does have a felak. The moon does have a felak. How is that wrong from a heliocentric perspective? Once again, the argument is so lacking, quite frankly, so lacking, it's actually, I was con contemplating whether or not to dignify this with a response. I really was, because it's so weak. Now, what is the strongest part of their argument? Let me discuss it with you. The strongest part of their argument, which is not strong at all, but let's just go with it, is those parts of the argument where they mention, for example, the qissa or the story of Ibrahim alayhi salam and his interaction with Nimrod, which is in chapter number 2, verse number 258. Where Allah, where, where Allah narrates that Ibrahim alayhi salam says, yati min al -fa fa al kafar. That Allah brings the, the sun from the east, so bring it from the west. And so this Nimrod, this king that he was having a conversation with, the interlocutor, was not able to do so and then he was dumbfounded and bedazzled. And he realized, you know, he was dumbstruck, if you want to call it that, wherever it may be. For Buhit, Alladhi Kafar, the one who disbelieved. They say, look, it's saying here from the east and from the west, and therefore, the assumption is a stationary earth and that the sun is going around the earth. Really? Because let's look at chapter number 18, verse number 17, 
والله سبحانه وتعالى says وترى الشمس إذا طلعت تزاور عن كهفهم ذات اليمين وإذا غربت تقرضهم ذات الشمال وهم في فجوة منه that you see that when those individuals are in the cave you see the sun when it has rise it goes to the left of them and when it sets it goes to the right of them إذا طلعت تقرضهم وإذا غربت تقرضهم ذات الشمال when it's, when it's, when it's uh, setting it's going at the left so it's the right when it's, when it's rising and the left when it's setting now what is right and left? take about this for a second right and left will be absolutely useless references unless there is a point of reference what do you mean by that? even on a stationary earth model or a stationary, <laughs> stationary flat earth or stationary round earth whatever you want to say the, 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 the right and left have no meaning unless we're talking about a specific reference point. And if the Quran is talking about the right and left of them, yes, then this is perspectival. There's no doubt about that then. It has to be through the perspective of those individuals there. And what, in, what perspective is it? It's the anthropocentric phenomenological perspective. It has to be like that, otherwise it wouldn't make sense. It would be meaningless statements from the left and the right. Because, I mean, if you don't understand this, wallahi, this shows illiteracy, intellectual Ill illiteracy, intellectual uh, uh, foolishness. Clear, clearly, is from the anthropocentric perspective, from the human perspective as a reference point. So, if you look at all of those verses in the Quran, something quite interesting for your information. That if you look at chapter number 36, verse number 40, and that's actually funny enough, Funny enough, and interestingly enough, that's something they also mention. Chapter number 36, number 40. Uh, Before, and even the literalists, our literalist scholars, like <laughs> you want to call him a literalist or whatever you want to call him, Al-Albani. Uh, he looked at this verse and he says, it, it, it starts from, I think it was verse number 24 or something like this, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَآيَةٌ لَهُمْ الْأَرْضُ الْمَيْتَةِ That a, a, a sign for them, is the, is the dead earth. So he moves from the earth and then he goes to the sun and then it goes to the qamar and then he says showing, he, he makes the claim that ling and linguistically this is possible. Linguistically, absolutely possible. It's ma'atuf. It's conjunctive. So it could absolutely be the case that the, the earth, the sun and the moon, all of them are in orbit. And that is linguistically possible. We're not going to say jazman, like absolutely this is the case, but it's a possibility. And from all of those perspectives and more, we show that the Quran is a timeless book with multi-layered facilitation. Meaning that if someone from the 7th century were to look at it and approach it with their uh, naturalistic understanding and outlook, they would not be confused. And one, when someone from our, from, from our century, 21st century, looks at it, we would not be confused. And we don't even find it, quite frankly, against the cosmology of, uh, of today, or the popular cosmologies of today. So from all of those perspectives and more, it would seem that they are clutching at straws, trying their best, really trying their best, to force an eisegesis of the Qur'an with their superimpositions and their contriving, their... Uh, pretextual contriving into the verses of the Qur'an and I would say that this is a fool's attempt and it has been disproven and debunked and it should be uh, left in the dustbin of history and I hope this answers the question. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Today inshallah we're going to be talking about another claim that is made by the proponents of scientific miracles and we're not saying by the way that all of their claims are false. We're saying that the method itself has limitations, and we've discussed this, the limitations of the method in the, uh, in the video about Big Bang. And there will be a discussion, another video about the multi-layered approach, uh, which is, we believe, a more sophisticated approach to dealing with naturalistic verses in the Qur'an. But in terms of this now, the, uh, the claim that is usually made when trying to prove Islam is scientific, uh, is a claim uh, in chapter number 79, verse number 30, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, well, And they said, or they, they translate this to mean, and the earth, we have made it into an ostrich egg, egg. Now, this is a false translation, with all due respect to all of those who are making this or saying this. It's a false translation, which is why, to my knowledge, I don't think anybody has ever translated that into the English language in this way. And not only this, but we would see that 
all of the exegetes of all time in the medieval period, practically all of them or none of them had said uh, anything like this. So this is probably one of the worst examples, with all due respect once again, of uh, distortion and superimposition and contriving meanings into the verse which are not actually there in any way, shape or form. So what does this verse actually mean? It means that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has smoothed over the earth. In other words, he hasn't made it craterous in, in such a way as the moon is, for example. We can move around the earth and there are uh, flat surfaces all over the earth. Now, why do these individuals, or what potential tenuous link could individuals make between an ostrich egg and this verse? Well, an ostrich egg is referred, uh, not even the ostrich egg, by the way, sorry. Uh, the place wherein which, and this is the uh, degree of uh, tenuousness uh, in, in, this, in this attempt here, the place wherein which the ostrich lays this egg is called a mudha. This is, is called that. Uh, not, not the ostrich egg, the bayda itself of the na'ama, not the ostrich egg itself, but the place in which the ostrich puts this egg is called the mudha. Now this is a noun. But this verb in the, sorry, this verse in the, in, the, in the ayah is not mentioning a noun. So how can you translate it as a noun? Because the verse is a verb. Dahaha. He done daha to it. Ha is aida ila al ard. Yeah, ha is because ard is mu'annatha. It's, 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 it's feminine in the Arabic language. Well, ard ba'da thalika dahaha. So Allah has smoothed it over and he's kind of removed the craters or has made it, not removed the craters, hasn't made it craterous in such the same way as maybe the moon is or has put so many mountains that would be, find difficulty to move around in the environment. This is what is practically all the Mufassirun have said from uh, Al-Tabari to Ibn Kathir to Ar-Razi to, I haven't seen anybody quite frankly who has understood this meaning to mean that it's a place where the, where the air, oh, sorry, the, 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 the earth is made into an egg. Now this doesn't mean that the earth is pro projected in the Quran as uh, being flat. As we've said before, there's, there is precedent using verses from the Quran, using verses from the Quran that indicate the rotundity or the rotundity, sorry, or the roundness of the earth. And uh, we have actually an entire video which you can see in the description box which elaborates upon them. But briefly, I'll just mention that this is chapter number 39, verse number 5. He rolls the night into the day, and he rolls the day into the night. So, taqweer here comes from the Arabic word qura, which means ball. Uh, and this is what Ibn Hazm, uh, in his book Al-Fisal, he mentions. He mentions that this, uh, and by the way, he was like 4th century or 5th century. So he is a medieval scholar uh, that came before, you know, the scientific revolutions. And he, said he used this verse. He used this verse in Surah Al-Zumar, chapter number 39, verse number 5, to indicate that the earth is round. And this is not just him. We talked about Ibn Taymiyyah mentioning Tabais, like Ibn Munada, who uh, say that the earth is round. And in fact, he says it's ijma', it's a consensus. Not only this, but Ibn Jawzi, who we mentioned in the previous video about the Big Bang, uh, Ibn Jawzi also mentions uh, the rotundity of the earth. Many scholars, uh, Fakhruddin al-Razi does, and his tafsir, and many other people do. And they, 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 they can do this, like I've just mentioned with Ibn Hazm, by looking at verses of the Quran which linguistically indicate the rotundity of the earth. Now, having said this, okay, we've said that there is a difference of opinion, and we're not saying that no one in Islamic history has ever said that the earth is flat, and there have been individuals that have tried to use the Quran to indicate the flatness of the earth. That might be true as well. But we always say that is definitely not the only uh, interpretation. And Islam is quite unique, quite frankly, in that it has exegetes who use verses from it to indicate the rotundity of the earth. Whereas you'll find uh, in, in other scriptures, like for example, the Old Testament uh, and the New Testament, the patristic scholarship all the way up to probably uh, Augustine that have uh, done exegesis of, of the Bible on these matters, none of them, uh, probably up until the time of Augustine, believed that the earth was round anyway. And those who did never use verses from the Bible, including that tenuous verse in uh, the book of Isaiah, uh, chapter number 40, where it says the, the circle of the earth. No, no one understood the circle of the earth as meaning the ball of the earth. And therefore, no one used the Bible in, uh, in, in patristic scholarship, as we, see, uh, as we can see, by looking at all of the exegesis uh, in the first 300 years of Christianity, using the Bible or even the, the Midrash, the, uh, the, 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 the Jewish texts, which, are the, which were written quite uh, astonishingly and interestingly enough, sometimes after the patristic uh, texts were uh, exegeted. 
they don't use the biblical verses to indicate the rotundity of the earth, or the spherical nature of the earth. If they do believe it, it might be due to the fact they, they had Greek influence. And this tenuous verse, uh, the circle of the earth, does not and has not meant for the, uh, uh, the authors of uh, Midrash, meaning the, uh, the, the, the exegesis of the Old Testament, to mean rotundity. And there's no scholar that has ever used in the first 300 years of Christianity or even in the Midrash any verse to indicate that the earth is round in the Bible. Well, there have been uh, scholars who have used verses from the Quran, uh, very early scholars, to indicate that the earth is round. Now, why am I saying this? Because I'm offering a solution. But what I don't, what we can't endorse, with all due respect, is superimpositions onto the text. And I actually believe a retraction is necessary here because there is no precedent for this. There's no precedent for anyone saying that this verse means and we have made the earth ostrich egged. No one has said that of all due respect. And therefore, we have to be humble and we have to be sincere and we have to make a retraction here because this is the Quran we're talking about. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Wa anta qulu ala Allahi ma la ta'lamun. He mentions many things and of the worst things that you can do. And he says at the end of the verse, Wa anta qulu ala Allahi ma la ta'lamun. That you say about Allah what you don't know. And so this is not what Allah has intended because it's not uh, facilitated by the language. And there should be a healthy retraction by those proponents of the scientific miracle narrative who have said this, um, who have said that it's ostrich egg shape. There should be a retraction because we can't be demanding from all of those scientific error people, okay, the anti-Muslims, uh, anti-Islam uh, apologists, all these retractions and not be introspective and self-reflective in our own communities. And we have to try and get, yani, sanctify the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as much as we can. And these are the dangers of the scientific miracles narrative where you almost forcibly superimpose meanings of science into the, uh, into the text where there's no requirement to do so because there's actually healthy alternatives with great precedent and which are facilitated by the language in the very Quran that uh, we believe in. So uh, this uh, one of the weakness, uh, weaknesses of the scientific miracles narrative. But as I've said in the beginning of this video, that we will be talking about the multi-layered approach and how it solves these problems and more uh, and it's much more sophisticated and it doesn't fall into the pitfalls uh, of the scientific miracles narrative that we've seen for the last uh, maybe 20 years. And I hope that answers the question. Wassalamu alaikum warahmatullah. Today inshallah we're going to be talking about the Big Bang and whether or not the Quran talks about the Big Bang or actively teaches the Big Bang. And of course, this is a ubiquitous kind of claim that you find with those who espouse the scientific miracles narrative, both in the Western world, in the English speaking world, and of course, the Middle East as well. I'm sure in other parts of the world that I don't have access to, unfortunately, because my language skills are limited. But let's say, um, let's answer this question, the question of whether the Quran or not actively speaks about the Big Bang. Before we do this, though, I think it's very important to note that here at Sapiens Institute, we think that the most sophisticated way of dealing with the Quran in, in so much as it talks about the naturalistic phenomena of the world is to apply a multi-layered approach. And this approach really says that the Quran speaks in a simple and concise yet powerful and rich way, which communicates with different uh, audiences from the 7th century all the way through to the 21st century. And it also says that when we're looking at verses, when we're looking at verses, we need to allow ambiguities to, to remain as ambiguities. In other words, picking one uh, of many different interpretations and claiming that this is a scientific miracle is a limitation. Now, obviously, this method requires, or the multi-layered method requires a video in its own right. It deserves uh, more attention. And of course, we're going we're gonna to do that. But for the purposes of today, we're not going to be going into much depth. Uh, however, there's one more thing I think is important to put forward in terms of conceptual analysis, which is David Schatz, uh, his conception or compartmentalization of concordism into two different types. Now, what is concordism? Concordism, loosely defined, is uh, the uh, propensity of a scripture, whether it's the Bible or the Quran or whatever, to be in agreement with science or to actually actively teach science. Now, David Schatz divides it into two different things. He refers to it as bold concordism and modest concordism. So bold concordism is really the uh, postulation that the scripture is actively speaking about said scientific phenomena. And modest concordism is that the scripture may not speak about it in such explicit terms, but indeed 
uh, is not against it in such explicit terms, or wh whatever said phenomena is. And I think the modest concordance position is much more tenable from a hermeneutical and exegetical perspective. Now let's move on to this, uh, this Big Bang example and, and, and look at the verses. So obviously this is chapter number 21, verse number 30, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, you know, that the, unit, the heavens and the earth, that they were both one piece, so we separated them. This is a loose translation, and it's a very legitimate translation, because if you look at the exegetes like At-Tabari and Ibn Kathir and Qurtubi and all of these major kind of exegetes of the past, and obviously also the Arabic language, Ratq and Fatq literally just means Ratq for something to be together and Fatq for, the, for them to be separated. However, when you look at what these exegetes say, they do actually... Um, expound on different types of meaning. So for example, yes, it does say that the heavens and the earth were together and then we cleft them asunder or whatever way, separated them or whatever way you want to translate it. But they also say that this could mean that this is when the, uh, the sama or the skies started to rain and when the uh, grounds started to produce vegetation. This is another exegesis that is of the same verse. And many of the salaf and many of those uh, medieval commentators took this as the, as the primary meaning, in fact. And that is why uh, the next verse talks about we have made from water every living thing. It says it makes more sense in that sense. But we will leave both of those interpretations as valid interpretations. Now, th those interpretations and more have been said about this verse. So to choose one of them, are we justified in choosing one of them because the dominant scientific theory of the day is uh, espouses or is closer to that one of them? I think we should be more reserved and conservative with this because quite frankly, of all the different kinds of sciences that are out there, you could argue, make an, a strong argument that physics and especially astronomy is the most volatile in terms of change. I mean, paradigm shifts. We know not only the Newtonian to Einsteinian shift, but all kinds of theories have been elaborated upon in the last hundred years in science and astronomy. I mean, string theory, oscillating universe, eternal universes. I mean, you can see from the, from the writings of some of the most prominent scientists that we have, like Roger Penrose, for example, and in 10 or 20 years, he changes his mind on very foundational issues when it comes to cosmology. Therefore, to pin, you know, a, a verse in the Quran on the changing and corrigible and uh, moving, if you like, scientific discourse, I think is quite dangerous because what if in, in 50 years, in 70 years or 100 years, the dominant cosmology is different? And that is a very plausible scientific possibility. It's extremely plausible for the dominant cosmology to have sh shifted. And for this reason, this for me defines another limitation of saying that the Quran talks about the Big Bang Theory, which is that, okay, if, you, if you're saying this today, let's see if you remain consistent, maybe if your grandchildren remain consistent that have your same uh, uh, methodology, where all of these Western scientists are now changing their mind and it becomes an oscillating theory, and then maybe you go to another interpretation. But this movement uh, of science and also the fact that there are different interpretations kind of says to me that we shouldn't be cherry picking verses and trying to make them match, you know, the interpretations match with modern day scientific phenomena. Because if we do that, we're actually outlining a failed hermeneutic and we're actually justifying for those uh, individuals who are attacking Islam, the detractors of Islam, who use one of many uh, interpretations which might be unscientific and legitimate through the language, that this is a legitimate recourse. So if we're saying that we will we'll take one of many different interpretations and now we're going to elaborate upon that, then that, what, what that does is it opens a can of worms because now the, uh, uh, the detractor or anti-Muslim apologist is well justified in saying that according to the Quran, the heaven, or sorry, the earth was created before the heaven, for example, and this is the opinion of this person and that, that person. Well, we'll, we'll come back and say, well, hold on, the opinion of the other person and that person is opposite to that. Well, they'll say, well, hold on, you have justified to yourself taking an ambiguous verse and, and, and saying that it means this when there are these other alternate, linguistic alternatives and exegetical alternatives. So why are we not within our rights to choose unscientific interpretations and say this is what it means? Well, in fact, this whole idea of using ambiguous verses which have more than one interpretation and running with it is exactly the opposite. Exactly the opposite of what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us to do in the Quran. That there are this chapter 3 verse 7 it says that this book has 
uh, verses which are foundational and others which are ambiguous. For those people who have swerving in their hearts or some kind of deviance in their hearts, they will choose, yes, those interpretations that they, uh, which are ambiguous. And they don't know what the, the verse goes on to say, they don't know what these interpret. no one knows what these, the interpretation actually definitely, definitively means, except for Allah. And some say, well, and also those who are very grounded in the knowledge. And some say, no, not even those because the sentence starts, and that's another discussion. But the idea is that choosing one of many different interpretations and insisting that this is what the Quran says is not the, uh, the sophisticated hermeneutical method. And in fact, it can go into and that you may say about Allah which you don't know. It may go into that. Or it could go into what the Prophet said Whoever lies about me intentionally, then let him prepare his seat in the hellfire. Where you know that there are other interpretations, but you're intentionally choosing one so you can fit it with a particular narrative. Uh, and so this is problematic. So from all of those perspectives, that you have changing science, that it's a cherry picking approach, that you know it's limited. And you know, you could even say one of the possible assumptions, I'm not saying it's a definitive assumption, is that if it is talking about the Big Bang, if it, let's say that chapter 21, verse number 30, is talking about the Big Bang. If it is talking about the Big Bang, does that mean to say that those people in the seventh century who had no knowledge of astronomy would have had this verse or the meaning of this veiled to them? Like they wouldn't understand the implications of the Big Bang. And so this verse would be meaningless or very, very close to being meaningless to them. So that would be, a, 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 yani, a, this, this could be something which is also damaging. The truth of the matter is this verse does indicate to us that there was some kind of separation. But we don't know, wallahu alam, what exactly cosmologically it's talking about. And similarly, with Samat banaynaha bi aidin wa inna lamusi'un. You know, that the, the heaven we have in chapter 51 of the Quran, the heaven we have created it with power and we, we are steadily expanding it. Now, yes, there are some people, even Tabi'is, that I've looked at the tafsir and the exegetes that say that Musi'un uh, does mean expanding. There are some Tabi'is who say that. Like, for example, Abdul Rahman ibn uh, Zayd ibn Aslam. And I've read this in uh, uh, Ibn Jawzi's kitab, uh, Zayd al Masir. And so this is definitely represented in the literature. I'm not taking that away from, uh, from, from that. However, there's a few issues. It says, It doesn't say sama dunya, for example. And we know, and we've talked about this in other episodes, that sama means all that, is an, all that is above. And so this does not necessitate that it's just a worldly dunya that we associate with the universe. So this might be talking about something which is completely above and beyond our understanding because we haven't even accessed the other six heavens, for example. And it could be talking something above the six heavens, because sama could involve the kursi and the arsh, technically. So why are we getting ourselves, okay, it's talking about the expanding universe for sure. We don't know Allahu A'lam if it's talking about the expanding universe for sure, because quite frankly, the majority of exegetes says, inna la musi'un, ay inna la qadirun. Musa'un means we are able to do so. Like, we are qadr, we're able to do so. Allah, we created the heaven with power and we were able to do so. And there's no contradiction between the two meanings. And yes, it could mean both. But to insist it's talking about the expanding universe and redshift, I think is a bit, uh, is a bit much. And if you do insist it's definitely talking about this, and this is how we should understand the verse, then once again, the cherry picking approach and the inconsistencies of it, you'd have to afford for the khasm, for the interlocutor, which in this case will be the anti-Muslim apologist, who's going to use uh, unscientific interpretations in much the same way as you're using scientific ones. So what needs to be done here is we need to remain consistent and we, re we need to understand the limits of, of using this kind of uh, evidence. And what, quite frankly, in the last 20 or 30 years, we've seen the, the strengths and uh, uh, weaknesses of this, the advantages and disadvantages. The advantages, if you, from a Dawah perspective, quite frankly, if you try and bring people into Islam because of this, those people that you bring into Islam because of this will be most affected by the anti-Islamic apologists when they provide for them, for, uh, for them uh, equal or similar types of argumentation using equal or similar uh, methods. And so... It, it, it could, and we have seen, and we have the evidence that it could increase apostasy for those particular individuals who have been convinced of Islam because of that reason. So one has to exercise extreme caution here, and they have to be uh, consistent, and they, and they have to do justice to the Quran, and leave that which is ambiguous as ambiguous, and speak with... Um, uh, speak with with a sophisticated tongue, not uh, when 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 it's, when it's an ambiguous verse, because no one knows really what this verse 
exactly is talking about. And I hope that answers the question. But finally, I will say, as Muslims, can we believe in the Big Bang and can we believe in the expanding universe and redshift in the beginning of the universe? Absolutely. I don't see any problem with that. And in other videos, you see that we're talking about, for example, the, the days meaning something which is longer, uh, an epoch or, or generational time period. So it doesn't need to mean a 24-hour period. So from those perspectives, I see no harm in believing the Big Bang Theory, so long as you believe that Allah is the one who created or uh, who initiated it. Yeah, I, I don't see any issue with believing it, so long as Allah is the orchestrator of it, and he is, this is part of his khalq. But you should, uh, from a scientific perspective, be a little bit more, uh, less eager, and a bit more, use the word agnostic really, because we don't know for sure how far this Big Bang Theory is, uh, is true, because quite frankly, it's underdetermined. From a philosophy of science perspective, there's like uh, maybe 16 or 17 differing models with very similar epistemic weight. And so this underdetermination should allow us to realize that from an Islamic perspective, it's a and it's not qat'i uh, al And therefore, we should not, uh, which means it's speculative and it's not something which is certain. Uh, and so we shouldn't need to feel the need to really uh, overcompensate here with this issue. And I hope that answers the question. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Today, inshallah, we're going to be tackling a contention that some of these anti Islamic apologists have tried to put forth. One that stipulates or that asserts, we could say, that the Quranic pr presentation of cosmology is one that says that the sun. It sets into a, a murky water spring. And why do they say that? Because of a verse in Surah Al-Kahf, chapter 18 of the Quran, where Dhul Qarnayn, one of the protagonists, one of the uh, characters of the Quran, he goes uh, to a certain destination and then he says that he sees the sun, وَجَدَهَا تَغْرُبُ فِي عَيْنٍ حَمِئَةٍ That he, see, he saw the sun uh, setting in a muddy spring. And they say this shows, uh, because uh, it's very clear in the Quran, they would argue that this shows that the sun, according to the Quranic cosmology, yes, uh, setting in a, in a spring of uh, uh, <laughs> murky water. Now let's, let's look at what the Mufassirun, the uh, exegetes of the Quran aforetime have said. Look at Baydawi, look at Ibn Kathir, look at Ibn Taymiyyah. Even though he didn't do like a, you know, a, a tafsir of the Quran, but he mentions this by mentioning that all of the spheres of the, uh, the, 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 the Falak are mustadira or, or spherical. And al Qurtubi actually mentions in his tafsir that this, <laughs> yani, because obviously he was preaching or he was his homiletic type of exegesis was also being preached to a non-Arab audience. And a lot, a lot of individuals there didn't understand that the word wajada could actually mean is perspectival. It's from the perspective of the individual. He said this is obviously not talking about the sun, which is many, many times bigger than the earth in which we live in, sinking into the, yani the, uh, the, the spring of, uh, of murky water in that literalistic sense. And what is the evidence of this from the Arabic language? The evidence of this is the word wajada, wajada, which is what the word, the operative word that is used in this verse. It means one of the key meanings of it, according to Al-Sohani, who wrote obviously one of the most authoritative uh, dictionaries for referencing the Arabic language, uh, Al-Fadh Mufrat Al-Quran. He says in it that this uh, wajada could mean anything from the five senses. So it's perspectival and it's something from the five senses that is experienced from the person experiencing them. So this wajada is clearly in the Arabic language, perspectival, and it's the anthropocentric phenomenological perspective. And so from this perspective, it seems to me that this is really flogging a dead horse or trying to put into the Quran what they wish really was clear in the Quran and that they hoped was already in there. Now you imagine sometime after today, maybe a hundred years from now or 200 years from now, some atheists that live on, if the world continues to that, <laughs> that, that period of time, as they say, look at these fools that lived in the 21st century. They used to say that the sun sets, but we know from modern science that the sun doesn't set. We would say that these people are foolish, they don't understand how language works because sunset in the English language, because it's not something foreign. Sunset is, is obviously from our perspective, it's a linguistic kind of, uh, if, not idiom, but it's something which is uh, common speech and is not intended in that literalistic way. So we would be saying that to them. Obviously, why can't you apply the same kind of common sense with the Quranic discourse? It's because you're begging, you're, you're, you're desperate to find some kind of thing, an entrance point for your narratives. And this is weak. Another thing that I would add, 
or that they say is that well, had, there's another hadith which corroborates our understanding, which is the hadith when the Prophet was asked, supposedly asked, where does the sun set? And he says, Taghrubu fi ayn hamia, that it goes into a spring of muddy water. Now, this love of the hadith, this particular phraseology of the hadith, was, um, uh, th- was narrated by one individual called uh, Al Hakim ibn Atayba, who is seen as a modellist, which means that he's weak. Basically, this individual does something called an'ana, which means that he doesn't tell us where he gets his information from. Uh, he doesn't tell us who his teacher is. And so, this an'ana is a form of disqualification from the hadith science perspective. And so, this particular phraseology is not to be understood as strong. The, and it's, that's why it's not mentioned Bukhari and Muslim. In fact, the hadith which is mentioned Bukhari is the one that we talked about in the other, in the other video, which of course you can watch in conjunction with this one if you want more information. The hadith of prostration. Now, if one argues that even though this is the case, we can do tahsin of the hadith or some kind of uh, strengthening of this hadith, and there are some scholars that say this hadith is strong, and so on and so forth, well, we can say that if you want to play with weak hadiths and weak narrations, we can also bring forward the qira'ah of Ibn Mas'ud and qira'ah of Ibn Abbas, which is actually weak, uh, but can be argued to be strong in the same or similar senses that this one, where it says, وَالشَّمْسُ تَجْرِي لَا مُسْتَقَرَّ لَهَا That the sun runs and it has no place of setting. Is actually something which is attributed to both Ibn Abbas and Ibn Mas'ud. Now, one can argue if we do take this on board, wouldn't this run counter to what the Quran says? Was Shamsu Tajrili Mustaqar Laha? That it runs to a, a place of uh, uh, appointed for it. Well, actually, it, it, the jama'a could be made, or contradistinction can be made between, or harmonization could be made between the two, in so much as that we can say that one is talking about time or the Day of Judgment, in the case of the, the Qira'a, which is well known, and the other one is talking about place. And of course, we can make those arguments, but I won't make those arguments, because we have to stick with the integrity of the Islamic tradition of authenticating that which is authentic, and leaving inauthentic that which is inauthentic, or does not have the, um, the apparatus for being something which is an authentic hadith that should be taken as uh, a gospel, if you like, or in this case, uh, Qur'an wahi. For, for the Muslim. So uh, I would say that if you want to play with weak hadith, we can all play with weak hadith and weak narrations and weak qira'ah. And in fact, the one that I have is much clearer in, uh, by way of trying to prove the heliocentric model than the one that they have by way of trying to prove that the sun actually uh, literally uh, sets in the spring of muddy water. And this, of course, runs counter to the Islamic understanding or the Quranic reading where it says that the sun is in its own orbit in chapter number 21, verse number 33, in chapter number 36, verse number 40, in, chapter, in many different, in chapter number 35, verse number 39, verse number 5, in different places of the Quran. So in summary, therefore, this is a weak and uh, feeble uh, contention, a specious claim, which I hope now has been been uh, completely and utterly refuted and hopefully that answers the question. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Today inshallah we're going to be talking about a contention which is put forward by some of those detractors, namely one that talks about the Noah's Ark narrative. Now obviously we know this narrative is also in the Bible but this specific narrative, or this specific uh, contention, I should say, is leveled directly at the Qur'an. In particular, leveled at uh, chapter 11, verse 40 of the Qur'an, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that bring on it, min kullin zawjain ithnain, from uh, every pair or every kind a pair. From every kind a pair, male and female. So they say it's virtually impossible to fit all the species of the earth all the species, male and female, on this ship. What kind of ship would this be anyway? It's virtually impossible to put all these animals. And when we say pair, I mean, it's saying from every... It's not even saying animals here. It's saying, kullin, zawjain ithnain. From every kind, or min kullin. Anything that can have a pair, really. Zawjain ithnain. Now, do we understand this, literalistically? So, the answer to this question is this. The operative words here, min kullin, zawjain ithain, or kull, the word kullu in the Arabic language, which literally means every, in one of the translations of this term, is what is the source of confusion. Because some people read this and have a very literalistic interaction with this word. This word does not only mean, this word kull in the Arabic language, does not only mean every single thing. It can also mean many things. And what is the evidence of this? The evidence of this can be found in the Quran itself. Where in chapter 46 in Surah Al-Ahqaf of the Quran, in verse number 25, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, تُدَمِّرُ كُلَّ شَيْءٍ بِأَمْرِ رَبِّهَا That it destroys everything with the command 
of your Lord is talking about a wind. فَأَصْبَحُوا لَا يُرَى إِلَّا مَسَاكِنُهُمْ So they could not be seen except for their places of inhabitation or uh, residence. So in other words, it's not talking about everything because this verse is being very clear that this wind destroyed many types of things. It destroys كُلَّ شَيْءٍ Everything, the same words here. كُلَّ شَيْءٍ the word kul is there, meaning every, right? It destroys everything. So nothing of the, them was seen except for their homes. We can't see anything except for their places of residence, yani, their homes. So clearly this is not talking about everything. This wind didn't destroy the universe, the cosmos, and this and that. And almost every usuli, uh, this is a branch of Islamic science, it's called Usul al-Fiqh, which is the principles of jurisprudence. They use this in their tracts and their treatises, the word kul, and it's called, it's actually a category of thing called al-am ladhi yurad bihi al-khusus, or al-khas, that it's something which is general, and what is intended from it is a specific thing. So it's a kind of usage of the language which was understood by the scholars of Islam. One of the scholars of Islam, a Suyuti, who died 9-11 after Hijri, he in fact wrote a book about this word kul, al-kul uh, ma'alayhi tadul, this is the name of the book. And in it he shows that there are usages of the word kul, which is literalistically translated as every, which cannot mean every single, such that nothing is excluded from that particular genus or circumstance, whatever it is we're talking about, universal, whatever it is we're talking about. And so, with this, I should say one more thing, that as I started this discussion, a lot of people are taking the Genesis narrative and putting it onto the Qur'an. There are some very many differences. For example, a literal reading, not a literalistic one, but a literal reading of Genesis may take someone who's an evangelical or who takes a literal understanding of the Bible, uh, like answers in Genesis and those individuals, to the conclusion that the whole world was consumed by flood and that all individuals had to be put on the ship or, uh, and animals and everything had to be put on the ship. That is a, a, an interpretation for the Bible we are under no obligation to believe that it was a worldwide flood and we are under no obligation to believe that all the entire world's animals and species had to be put on the ship for the reasons aforementioned. But I hope with that the contention is cleared and with that I end this episode. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Today we're going to be responding to a contention which some people, anti-Islamic apologists have used and even it's in, on some of their websites about a hadith uh, which talks about the black seed and if you wanted to translate it literalistically it would read that it's a cure for every disease. But is this the case? How could it be the case? I mean, is it a cure for cancer, for AIDS, for all of those things? Do we not need hospitals anymore? Cancer research needs to shut down because now we have the black seed? No, the hadith does not mean uh, all of the diseases, uh, barring none. This is, of course, a literalistic uh, reading of the hadith, which has no bearing on the actual meaning of that hadith. And this is not even how the medieval uh, scholars, the shurrah, the uh, commentators of this hadith have understood it, even from as far back as Ibn Hajar al-Asqalani and others and other individuals like Ibn Qayyim al jawzi and his Kitab Zad al-Mi'ad and others who spoke about the Black Seed and this hadith in particular, and all of which who I've read anyway, uh, specify that it's not talking about all the diseases, uh, but it's talking about many different kinds of uh, diseases. And this is something which we know from the usage of the word kul, which is in this hadith, which is also used in the Quran. Where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions in Surah Al-Ahqaf, chapter 46, verse number 25, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, تُدَمِّرُ كُلَّ شَيْءٍ بِأَمْرِ رَبِّهَا فَأَصْبَحُوا لَا يُرَى إِلَّا مَسَاكِنُهُمْ That it destroys, there's a wind that destroys everything, uh, with the command of its Lord, so they came to be uh, not seen 
except for their indwellings. And of course, uh, this does not mean that this wind that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is talking about is a wind that destroyed everything, including animals and the earth and the cosmos, even though there's the exception there, illa masakinuhum, except for their indwellings. It doesn't mean everything was destroyed except for the indwellings. So the uh, kul here is not intended by any means or any stretch of the imagination to mean every single thing on the face of the earth, let alone the entire existence or entire universe. This is impossible to extrapolate from this verse. And that is why many of the scholars have actually written books and treatises about this word kul, because many people that employ literalistic understandings of uh, the Arabic language do not understand these kinds of usages. So Siyulti wrote a book, Al Kul wa Ma Alayhi Tadul, or the word kul and what it implies or what it uh, evidences or shows. So this should be very clear now that the, uh, the black seed is not actually a cure for every single disease except death. It's not a cure for every single disease because the Prophet Muhammad himself told us that Allah has not sent down any disease except that he sent down with it except that he sent down with it you know a cure in other words for every specific disease there is a lahu a wada lahu he allah has prescribed for it a cure a specific cure and thus uh, if if uh, this was not the case and black seed could solve all of our problems then such a hadith would indeed indeed be a futile one uh, and would not make any sense so that is why we have to look at the entire corpus of hadith before we rush to conclusions in summary therefore those individuals who try and use this hadith and others to try and mock Islam and Muslims are but surely uh, lost in their own ignorance and indeed have a very superficial understanding, newspaper understanding, cursory understanding uh, of the hadith tradition. And I hope that is intellectually as satisfying as it is for you as it has been for me. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Today, inshallah, what we're going to be doing is dealing with a very prominent hadith that you'll find in many of the anti-Islamic apologetics and anti-Islamic websites of those individuals who are trying to attack the deen, the religion of Islam. So this is a, a, a famous hadith really, a cosmological hadith, which is mentioned by Abu Dhar al-Ghafari. And the contention is that this hadith fully supports without a shadow of a doubt, a geocentric model. And in fact, some add to this and say it um, shows that the Quranic picture or that the Islamic cosmology generally is that of not only a flat earth, which they've said and spoken about and we have a separate video on, but one which is flat and stationary and where in which the, uh, the sun is going around it in, in a geocentric way. And thus it's confirming the uh, 7th century, you know, understanding of cosmology and this is an evidence that it's false. So as I've mentioned, the uh, discussion of flat earth versus round earth is in a separate video which you can find on this series. So if you want to um, see me talk about that, you can pause the video now, watch that video and come back. Now in regards to this particular video, let's read the hadith in question and move on to what the specific contentions are. So the hadith is narrated by Abu Dhar al-Ghifari. May Allah be pleased with him. And he said that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Do you know where the sun set? Do you know where it goes? I said, Abu Dhar says, Allah and his messenger know best. He said, it goes and prostrates beneath the throne. Then it asks for permission to rise and permission is given to it. Soon it will prostrate and it will ask for, for permission to rise, but permission will not be given to it. It will be said to it, go back to where you came from. So 
So it will rise from its place of setting. And that is what Allah, may Allah be glorified, may He be glorified, refers to in the verse. And the sun runs on its fixed course for a term appointed. And that is the decree of the mighty, the all-knowing. He's mentioning, uh, the Prophet Muhammad is mentioning an ayah, Surah Yaseen, chapter 36, verse number 38. tajri li mustaqarri laha. That the sun runs on a, on a fixed uh, uh, term decreed. So let's talk about what the contentions are. The contentions really, you could say, are three in number. Three main contentions. The first one relates to this prostration of the sun. What do we understand from this uh, hadith when we talk about the prostration of the sun? Is it to be suggested that this is an anthropomorphic or a personified picture of the celestial sphere that is the sun? And isn't this more in line with mythology and ancient legend than it is with the scientific contemporaneous reality that we know from examination and from uh, advances in science? That's number one. The second thing is about the, 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 the going. How could the sun be going uh, underneath the throne? And this shows, they say, the fact that the sun is going somewhere in sunset, that it's confirming, they say, the geocentric picture. Thirdly, they say, the time of sunset. So why is it that the time of sunset is in any way significant? Knowing that sunset is at different times, at different points of the round earth, I know there may be some flat earthers listening to this and as I've said, there's a video for you guys or for other people uh, about the flat earth. So that's, these are the three main contentions. So let's deal with them one by one. And in terms of verses of the Quran, we will be discussing those verses of the Quran which people try to use to refer to geocentrism in an entirely different video. So the first issue that people have is in relation to prostration. They say, what is this prostration? The Quran says in chapter 17 That everything in the heavens and the earth uh, you know, glorifies Allah and nothing in the heavens and the earth does anything but glorify Allah but you do not understand the way in which that takes place. So this verse shows that the celestial bodies, the inanimate objects, all of those things in the world, whether living or not, has a means of glorifying Allah. And this is actually in the realm of the metaphysical. So science does not tap into this. And it has nothing to do with science. In fact, the Quran explicitly says, وَلَكِنْ لَا تَفْقَهُونَ تَسْبِيحَهُمْ In other words, the sun and the moon and or the universe it has a way of glorifying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which is distinctly different, distinctly different from the way in which we do so. So to try and impose an anthropomorphized or a personified understanding on the celestial spheres or the inanimate objects is nothing but going against the Quran and a misunderstanding of the entirety of the Quran. So the prostration is not a prostration like, you know, where you put your head on the floor or the fact that prostration requires stationary action from the human actor. In fact, with different um, uh, species, different animals, different inanimate objects, different spheres, the, the prostration does not in any way need to be correlated with such human prostration. It's not like the sun is growing arms and a forehead and is throwing itself on the floor. This is not the understanding. In fact, the Quran refutes this understanding very categorically. So this very uh, literal, it's not even literal, it's a literalistic reading of the Quran and the Hadith is, is, is the first point is the first point of confusion for those individuals who try and ask about the prostration. So clearly here, the prostration is referring to something which is metaphysical and untappable by the scientific method. And one can say that, you know, the prostration, not just the prostration, but the submission of the sun, the istislam and the sujood of the sun is expected since Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about that the heavens and the earth will obey Allah طوعاً أو كرها, willingly or unwillingly. In other words, they're obeying the laws of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, some individuals will say, so why does the hadith say that the Prophet Muhammad is saying that the sun is going somewhere uh, or to an appointed destination in the first place? 
Now, I want you guys to, to understand, in the Arabic language, there's two things, something called dharf zaman and dharf makan. That basically, when you're referring to destinations, there are two types of destination, time-bound ones and place-bound ones. As we'll come to know with this particular uh, hadith and the ayah in which it links with this particular hadith, which the Prophet Sallallahu mentioned itself, the sun, we know from tafsir, is going towards the day of judgment. And this is the tafsir of chapter 36, number 38, where it says, وَالشَّمْسُ تَجْرِي لِمُسْتَقَرِ اللَّهَ That the sun is running to a, a destination. What destination is it? Is it a time-bound destination or is it a place-bound destination? So the exegetes of Islam, the medieval exegetes, are talking about the end of day. So this is eschatological in nature. It's not talking about a particular place where in which it is going. Uh, whether this, those who espouse the scientific miracles narrative say it's the solar apex, and those who want to talk about the, uh, you know, the the scientific errors narrative are going to say it's beneath the earth. Both of which are not indicated by the primary text. And what's the evidence of this? The evidence of this is the exact phraseology, the exact terminology of the of the hab of going is mentioned in the Quran. Where is it mentioned? It's mentioned in chapter thirty-seven. And verse number 99, well, well where the, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala narrates that Ibrahim is saying, Inni dhahibun ila rabbi sayahdeen. I am going to Allah and He will guide me. The same exact phraseology, dhahib. Inni dhahibun. I am going. Now, what does this mean? Does that mean that somehow Abraham is doing an Isra al Ma'raj? You know, of his own? No, it doesn't mean that. It means, as Qatada says, that this is, in many ways, a figurative kind of going. Or if you don't want to say it's a figurative kind of going, uh, or something which is metaphoric, then you could say he is going with his, as Qatada says, who's part of the Salaf, of the predecessors. He says, this means that Ibrahim is going with his Amal, with his Niyyah, with his Qalb, with his Niyyah meaning with his intentions, with his Qalb meaning with his heart. Meaning, this the Hab or this going, it's not talking about a place-bound going. Now, bear that in mind, because there's another hadith which is ex extremely important, I, maybe ironically, but definitely interestingly, narrated also by Abu Dhar al-Ghafari. And I'll tell you why this is important. He says that the Prophet Muhammad said, The seven heavens and the seven earth, in comparison to the Kursi, is nothing but a ring thrown in the desert. And certainly the hugeness of the arsh over the kursi is like the desert over that ring. Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar. Look at subhanAllah, the, the, the magnitude of the khalq, of the creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Look at that. That the entire seven heavens is like a ring thrown in the desert compared to the kursi. Now the kursi is roughly translated as the footstool of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but it's something which is not, it can, it cannot be imagined. And then that compared to the arsh, which is the throne, and also the ceiling of creation is, is, is insignificant as well. Now, why am I mentioning this? Because the question is, is there something that the sun does? Or could there be on the Islamic cosmology, something that the sun does, or somewhere where the insignificant sun which is placed in the sama dunya in the worldly heaven. How do we know it's in the worldly heaven? Because Allah says, لَقَدْ زَيَّنَّا السَّمَاءِ الدُّنْيَا بِمَصَابِيحَ وَجَعَلْنَاهَ رُجُومٍ لِلشَّيَاطِينَ Anywhere with the celestial objects, in chapter 67, verse number 4, that is sama dunya So one of the seven heavens, and then you have the kursi, which is like a ring compared to that. The movement of the sun in, in, in this context, of the grand scheme, the cosmological grand scheme of things is completely insignificant. Does it mean to say that, and this is another question, does it mean to say that if it's going under the arsh, is the assumption, the false assumption, that it wasn't under the arsh in the first place, or the, the throne? It must have been under the arsh, because according to this hadith that I've just mentioned, and other things in the Quran as well, other ay ayat, isharat, that the throne is the ceiling of creation. So there's nothing that can be contained within the creation that would not be in any way under the arsh in the first place from the Quranic cosmological perspective. Thus, the sun was always underneath the arsh in as much the same way as Ibrahim was always on the earth, 
when he said, Inni dhahibun ila Rabbi sayahdeen. And so it's not insignificant to say that I'm going somewhere or that someone is going somewhere or to some time. When in fact they are staying in the same course that they are on a physical trajectory level. So this question of going somewhere, that the hab, the, the going of the sun, is one that has been confused by the compounded ignorance of those who fail to look at the entire corpus of the Quran and Sunnah, especially in the phraseological usage of the key terms that we have just mentioned. Also to add, it's very important, we said we started this segment off by talking about that there are two kinds of dharf, zaman and makan, or place and time, okay, in the Arabic language. And both of them have, for all intents and purposes, exactly the same grammatical and usually the same phraseological and, and se semantical s structures. Now here, we said that the, the hab of the sun or the going of the sun is not in reference to the um, actual going, the physical going, but in fact, it's about, it's a time bound varf zaman, not varf makan restriction. And what is the evidence of this from the sunnah? The evidence of this from the sunnah is that the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he ended the hadith with the dhikr or the mentioning of وَالشَّمْسُ تَجْرِي لِمُسْتَقَرِّ لَهَا And the sun runs to an, uh, 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 a determined, uh, a determined, to a, 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 a place slash time determined. It can be either. And we said here that almost all the exegetes agree that it's an eschatological referencing, meaning it's talking about the end times and the day of judgment. So this shows that when he was referring to Abu Dhar about the Dhahab of the sun, it was for eschatological reasons rather than um, cosmological reasons. And now, this is where probably the biggest issue that people have with this hadith lies, which is in the understanding that is it, why did the Prophet Muhammad mention this at sunset time? And they say this is probably the biggest indication of geocentricity or geocentrism. And the answer to this is actually, ironically, that this is probably, if you want to use anything, if you want to mention cosmology in this, uh, this, this sense, would, would uh, validate the heliocentric model. How is that possible? It could validate the heliocentric model. I'm not saying this is, this hadith is heliocentric, but that's not my claim, just to be clear. Just as I would say, it's not right to say it's talking about geocentrism. But why is that? You see, the Prophet ﷺ, he mentioned this hadith at the time of sunset. Now, if the assumption is, since he mentioned it in the time of sunset, that has to do with the movement of the sun. Because the, the sujood, he says that the sun set, and then it asks for permission to rise again from Allah SWT. He goes to the throne and asks permission to rise again. Now, if you think about it, there is a verse in the Quran, which is very powerful and telling. It is in chapter 22, verse number 18. Where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, أَلَمْ تَرَ أَنَّ اللَّهَ يَسْجُدُ لَهُ مَنْ فِي السَّمَوَاتِ وَمَنْ فِي الْأَرْضِ وَالشَّمْسُ وَالْقَمَرِ And then the verse continues. Do you not see that to Allah prostrates all things in the heavens and in the, on the earth and the shams, the sun and the moon? Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Why is this significant? Because if there is an inextricable link that is to be made between the sujood, the, prostrat the prostrating to uh, under the sun, uh, sorry, the, the prostrating of the sun, and the uh, sunset, ghurub, if there is an inextricable link, the Quran says, yasjudu lahu, and it's mentioned in uh, fi'al mudara, which means it's a continuous present tense. Wait a minute. What does this mean? It means to say that the sun is always prostrating to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's not doing it in the past. It's not sajada lah. And it's not doing it in the future. Or it's going to do it in the future. Sayasjudu lahu. Or sawfa yasjudu lahu. Because these would be the things you'd have to put in the prefix of the word. It's saying yasjudu lahu. Which means it's happening continuously in the present. Wait a minute. If this means what it says, then it would say, it would suggest 
that so long as the sun is prostrating, it's also setting. And obviously, if we now want to introduce the flat earth, stationary earth cosmology, which those detractors of Islam are insisting on their websites and on their anti-Islamic apologetics that the Quran depicts a, a flat earth, stationary earth cosmology with the sun going around it. Wait a minute. But on such cosmology, the sun would not be setting at all times. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Yes, because if it was a flat earth, stationary earth cosmology, the sun would go underneath the earth and there would be time periods where in which it's not setting on anybody at all. There would be no such thing as a constant ghurub or a constant sunset. So this, in fact, ironically, it actually takes away from the cosmology that they are trying to build in their scientific era narrative. And in fact, on the heliocentric model, and this is definitely the case, where in which the Earth rotates around its own axis, it's always setting. It's always setting on someone. The sun is always setting on someone. Why? Because the Earth is continually spinning around its own axis. Thus, if sujood or prostration is connected with ghurub or uh, 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 setting of the sun, then it must always have be setting. It must always be setting, and this would in fact negate the flat earth stationary, flat stationary earth geocentric cosmology, which these anti Muslims are trying to project. Now they could say, well, this is a contradiction between the hadith and the Quran, and if this was the case, the muhaddithin would have rejected it, and it would be seen as a'illah of the hadith, a hidden defect of the hadith, just like hadith al-Turba, for example, was rejected on similar grounds in Sahih Muslim. So if it was a contradiction, it would have been rejected because of metan criticism, or the criticism of the content of the hadith. But the ulama did not see it as that. So it's not something, it's, as we have just done now, uh, we have reconciled it with the Qur'an, we have reconciled it with a heliocentric model, so I don't think there's a, a, an issue here. And so, with all of this having said, being said, we can conclude, quite safely, that this hadith is not talking about the sun going under the throne, and it wasn't under the throne before that, or it's not talking about the sun going under the earth, because if it was, if it's a flat stationary earth, it would not be setting. And we know from the Quran it is, the sun is constantly prostrating. And if it's constantly prostrating, it must mean it's constantly setting. And therefore, the boomerang, the intellectual boomerang has hit them once again. It's always ironic that when those individuals, they try and attack Islam, the very evidences they use are usually used against them. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Inshallah, today what we're going to be talking about is something which relates to the subject of Qur'an and embryology and a particular contention which people have, which is that the Qur'an allegedly says, according to these detractors, that I've seen their material on anti-Islamic websites, that the Qur'an, uh, that the human being is made up from a congealed clot of blood, and we know from embryological uh, study that that is not the case. And they say the word alaqa, which is the operative word, the important word, it doesn't mean to cling or to be attached to something, which is what many Muslims of today say, which they say is a superimposition of uh, modern scientific jargon into the vocabulary of the Quran. So let's deal with these two contentions one by one. The first thing I'm going to be dealing with, inshallah, is the second thing I've just mentioned, which is the fact that this word alaqa cannot mean uh, something which clings or something which is attached to something else. And that in the vast commentarial tradition and the vast exegetical tradition for 1,400 years, this meaning was unknown to medieval scholars and this meaning was not used in this way to indicate attachment or connection. The truth of the matter is that is false. That, in fact, medieval scholars from the very early days of Islam were mentioning 
in their treatises, in their dictionaries, and in their exegetical and commentarial works. That in fact, alaqa does mean to be attached to or connected to. So I'll give you one or two examples. Ibn al-Jawzi, he says this, and he was a 6th century scholar. Uh, Al-Asfahani, who uh, has a dictionary talking about the mufradat of the Qur'an, or the singular words of the Qur'an. He also mentions that one of the meanings of the word alaqa is something to be attached to sahibuhu, to its companion. So something to be attached to something else, to be connected to it. So this is a specious and uninformed claim, quite frankly. I'm quite surprised, I'll be honest, that these individuals who are making these claims didn't do themselves the academic justice of looking at these medieval uh, books, or they were foolish enough to, to think that we were not going to do that. Indeed, these meanings are there, they are codified, they are written, and they exist. Now, the second contention is they say, well, we, okay, let's give it to you. It could mean to be attached to or connected to something, which will go in line with modern embryonic understanding of the embryo being attached to the uterine wall. And obviously, through the umbilical cord and, uh, and others, other things, uh, you know, uh, taking from the nutrients of the host, in this case, the mother. They say, fine, it's, it's in connection with this, but this other uh, thing or meaning is completely unscientific, which is the meaning of uh, a congealed blood, because they say it's not blood at all. Uh, it's not blood. The composition, the chemical composition of the fetus is not a bloody one. It's not one that is composed primarily of blood. And you see, this is where their argument is going to fall flat on its face. Because this, again, is a weakness of the understanding of the Arabic language. And in fact, a weakness of the understanding of the Sunnah of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Because the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam himself said, he said in the hadith that two things have become allowed for us, or two things which are mayit or dead, uh, and two things, and he referred to the word daman, two bloods. The word dam in Arabic means blood. He says two dam, two dams have become uh, uh, allowed for us. And the two dams in particular is the liver, al-kabid, and the spleen. Now, we know that the kabid, the liver, is not something which is composed primarily chemically from blood. But why is it the case that the Prophet Muhammad although some of the, the mufassirs of the hadith or exegetes of the hadith, they say this hadith is mawquf, which goes back to the sahabi. If that is the case, which I don't believe it is from reading the hadith tradition, and I believe it's marfu'a, going back to the Prophet, but even if it is mawquf, it's still what you call istishhad lughawi. It's still something to be, uh, uh, you can use it as a way in which the language was used. Either way, it doesn't matter. The blood was being in reference in this hadith, it was being in reference to something which is not chemically composed of blood, but it looks ready, reddish. So therefore, we can conclude that something which is not blood in chemical composition can yet be referred to as blood if it has the aesthetic appearance of that. And we know that the embryo has the aesthetic appearance of something which is congealed and bloody even though the chemical composition may not be so. Someone may say that the word alaqa shouldn't be treated the same way as the word dem, because dem means blood, and it was being used to refer to something which isn't chemically blood, but it itself is chemically blood. But this would not be applicable to the word alaqa. We would say, no, this is not the case, because the hadith itself talks about two dead things and two blood things. And the two dead things in question were not actually dead. So this shows that it, the word can be used in the Arabic language to reference aesthetics. So in other words, something might not be the thing, but you're using it to indicate the aesthetic similarity of the thing. Thus, this is a specious claim and a foolish one. The real question is, why use the word alaqa? 
when the Arabs had another word for the word fetus, which actually the Quran uses, which is the word janin, which means fetus. Why did the Quran specify the word alaqa? This is something because, subhanAllah, it's true. It's true the, the fact that the uh, embryo clings onto, is attached to the uterine wall. So it has this meaning which the word janin does not have. And in fact, the Quran could have said, qit'atun min dam, a congealed clot of blood. But the Quran did not use this phraseology. And indeed, it used a phraseology which is more specific and more in line with our understanding of embryology. And though this fits in with the multi-layered approach that we believe in here in Sapiens Institute, which is the idea that the Quran speaks to people in a timeless way, people of all times and all places, including us in the 21st century. And that is the reason, Wallahu A'lam, why Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala used this very specific word. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Today we're going to be talking inshallah about this issue of the earth being created or supposedly created before the heaven as per the Quran. This is the claim that many of these detractors make and is littered all over their uh, websites. So what is the claim? The claim is that the Quran says that the earth was created before the heaven and this is wholly unscientific, something which is primitive and uh, something which is more indicative of a 7th century type of um, uh, authorship rather than the create, creator of the heavens and the earth. So what are the verses that are being referenced with this kind of shubha? There are two main verses, actually two only verses in the Quran that uh, they use to, to make this, uh, this claim. The first is in chapter 2 verse 29, Surah Al-Baqarah, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَهُوَ الَّذِي خَلَقَ لَكُمْ مَا فِي الْأَرْضِ جَمِيعًا ثُمَّ اسْتَوَىٰ إِلَى السَّمَاءِ فَسَوَّاهُنَّ سَبْعَ سَمَاوَاتِ That he is the one who created um, all that is in the earth and then he turned to the heaven and made them as seven heavens. And in chapter number 41 verse number 12, Surah Al-Fussilat, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, فَقَضَاهُنَّ سَبْعَ سَمَاوَاتٍ فِي يَوْمَيْنِ وَأَوْحَى فِي كُلِّ سَمَاءٍ أَمْرَهَا That he is the one who ordained them as seven heavens in two days and he gave to each of those heavens its affair or their command. So they say, look, it's clear here that in the first verse that we've mentioned, the, the creation of the earth is mentioned and then after that, the creation of the heaven is mentioned and therefore that shows a clear chronology. And that is not a foolish interpretation of the Quran because Aslan as the default position, the word thumma, which is critical here, is usually used, as the Arabic grammarians say, or for um, subsequent um, chronology. So if something is saying, I did this, thumma this, thumma this, they're saying that they did this, and then they did this afterwards, and then they did, after, uh, they did this afterwards. But the reality of the situation is that you find in the Quran itself, examples where thumma is used conjunctively, and not as, uh, or not used chronologically. So for example, if you look at chapter number 6, verse 154, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, ثُمَّ أَتَيْنَا مُوسَ الْكِتَابِ تَمَامًا yeah, so, And then we gave Moses the book, uh, completed. مِنَ الَّذِي أَحْسَنَا وَتَفْصِيلًا لِكُلِّ شَيْءٍ And uh, from the one who perfected all things, and as a detail for everything. So, ثُمَّ here, even at tabari mentions in his tafsir, does not mean uh, conjunct, so it does not mean, sorry, a chronologically subsequent, it means here conjunctive, so it works like well. In other words, it doesn't mean something is happening after something else. Thus, we know now as a principle of language that thumma can actually mean something conjunctive and doesn't always have to mean something which is successive in the chronological way. But then what do we make of those two verses that we began this uh, video with? Well, the the Mufassirin or the exegetes of Islam are in disagreement. So, for example, you'll find Qatada, one of the early commentators of uh, the Quran, one of the most uh, foremost commentators of the Quran. In fact, part of the Salaf is a Tabai himself. He believed that the heaven was created before the earth. And thus, he doesn't believe the word Thumma here indicates a transition or a subsequent uh, movement of, of chronology. 
Likewise, many commentators, medieval commentators, believed the same thing. Ibn Hayyan being one of them, uh, Al-Qurtubi being another, and obviously these individuals all lived in the medieval period. Where you'll find that Al-Qatada, uh, sorry, Al-Qurtubi takes Qatada's view and he says this is the correct view, inshallah, meaning he believes that there was um, a, 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 there was no, cons there was no um, chronology indicated in these verses. And that's why um, actually many people like Fakhruddin al-Razi and his, uh, his tafsir does not believe also that that is talking about something and something else. So here you have two valid ways of looking at these verses. One of them is scientific and the other one is unscientific. Now for all intents and purposes, if we're looking at this just purely exegetically, both of those are fine interpretations. And both of, them, uh, both of those interpretations are supported by the language. One can have an unscientific understanding and believe that the, heaven, uh, the earth was created before the heaven. And one can have the idea that the, earth was the heaven was created before the earth. Both of those things are supported. In fact, when Qatada was making his argument, he says in chapter 79, verse 30, that Allah, he, uh, after that, he smoothed over the earth. He used this as a kind of evidence to suggest that the, uh, the heaven was already there. And if we really analyze these two verses that we talked about, one in Baqarah and one in Surah Al-Fusilat, it doesn't actually say Allah created the heavens after he created the earth. And this is critical here. It's extremely important. He says, فَسَوَّاهُنَّ سَبْعَ سَمَوَاتِ So he proportioned them as seven heavens. And a lot of people don't realize that السَّمَاءِ or the heaven is أَشْمَلُ مِنَ السَّمَوَاتِ is actually more comprehensive than the seven heavens. Why is that? Because السَّمَاءِ includes everything that is above, which could include the seven heavens and all those things which are above the seven heaven. And in Islamic cosmology, we have the Kursi and the Arsh, which are above the seven heavens, but are included in the Sama. So thus, the Sama, because in Lughat al-Arab, in the Arabic language, it means everything that is above, includes the seven heavens and includes more than the seven heavens. Thus, if the Sama was already created and Allah proportioned them as seven uh, heavens, it doesn't mean he created them after the event of creating the earth. It just means that the... The finalization process when it came to proportionment had taken place after the earth had already been created. But that's something completely metaphysical to us because according to the Islamic discourse, we live in Samat Dunya, the first of those seven heavens, because the Quran says, you know, we created in Surah Al-Mulk, we made the, we, we, we put basically uh, firmaments or luminaries in the, uh, in the, in the first heaven, in Samat Dunya. وَلَقَدْ زَيَّنَّ السَّمَاءَ الدُّنْيَا بِمَصَابِيحَ وَجَعَلْنَاهَا رُجُومًا لِلشَّيَاطِينَ We have created the Sama' dunya the first of those heavens, with masabih, which are luminaries, and we have made them pelting things for the shayateen. Thus, uh, one can uh, legitimately, exegetically have an unscientific approach, and one can have a completely scientific approach, if you wanted to put it this way, because it's not just Big Bang cosmology, it's almost all the theories out there would suggest that the universe, or the fabric of space, was created before the Earth. So, one can have that interpretation and one can have the other interpretation which is unscientific. But it's unfair, it's really unfair to say that the only interpretation which exists of these verses is an unscientific one. In fact, that is an ahistorical claim above all things because we know that the people from the Salaf all the way through the medieval times believed that the, the heaven was created first, the universe was created, you want to call it the universe, you can call it the universe, the heaven was created before the Earth. And in fact, they use, they use the Qur'an itself as an indication of that. So these are two valid interpretations. One side point, some people use a hadith, which is mentioned in Sahih Muslim. And in that hadith, it says that the, the earth was created on Sunday, Yom Al-Ahad. And then this thing was created on Monday, uh, Yom Al-Tnain. And then this thing was created on th uh, Wednesday, which sounds like a Genesis kind of narrative. Although this hadith is in Sahih Muslim, almost all the scholars, and Nisa'i, and Tirmidhi, and Bukhari himself, says this hadith is mu'allal, which means it has hidden defects, and this hadith is weak, it's rejected. And there are some hadiths, a few of them, in Sahih Muslim, and a few of them in Sahih Bukhari, which have been spoken about in those terms. So, that hadith now can't be used as an additional kind of evidence for those individuals who want to uh, push the scientific error narrative, 
uh, because quite frankly it's a weak hadith according to the major scholars of Islam. In summary, in summary we can say there are interpretations of naturalistic verses which are unscientific and this is probably one of the best cases to look at that. However, one can't just say that and stop. There is also, or there are also, those scholars and exegetes who interpreted the same evidence in a scientific way or in ways which correlate with 21st century science. Thus, the exegete should be left to their own devices and from an Islamic perspective this is not a kufri thing, someone cannot be a disbeliever for believing either of those things, they're two valid interpretations, but this is a specious claim if the claim is the correct interpretation is one was created before the other because we know the language is muhtamal, meaning it's inclusive enough to include both possibilities. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. So let's take a look at what they say. They look at chapter 67 verse 5 الدُّنْيَا بِمَصَابِيحِ وَجَعَلْنَاهَا رُجُومًا لِشَيَاطِينَ Where it says that we have thereby adorned the sama dunya, the worldly heaven, with luminaries and we have made them pelting things for the devils. And they say this means, or how could this be the case, they question. They say how could it be that you have these luminaries in the sky that are pelting devils? Uh, this is a very unscientific, they say. And moreover, they would go and say that it's probably the case that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he confused between the meteors, which are very small in size and composition, and stars. Because when they may have seen shooting stars, they, just, they thought that, that, were, that, that they were actual stars, and therefore, they argue, this is um, showing you the unscientific nature of the authorship of the Qur'an. This is, these are really the two arguments that are being made. And let's be honest, the first argument is a foolish argument because science is predicated on methodological naturalism. So what they're doing is a category mistake fallacy. They're using something which is predicated on <laughs> methodological naturalism to detect, to attempt to detect that which is clearly in the realms of the metaphysical, which is in this case the devil. The devil, the jinn, the angels, the heaven, hell, all of those things are seen as metaphysical things. Things which are not meant to be detected or tappable by the scientific enterprise, by the five senses. And thus, the first part of their argument is actually uh, shame on them really for, ha for having this limited knowledge on this, uh, on this kind of thing. And entering an arena of polemics with this limited knowledge uh, and embarrassing themselves and everybody else. But even more embarrassing is the fact that they are making this supplementary argument now that, well, the Prophet Muhammad must have been uh, confusing between the meteors and uh, the, 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 the celestial uh, spheres, um, the, uh, the, the, the moon, the sun, the stars, all those things. All of them are in one category for the Prophet and therefore he couldn't distinguish between a small rock-sized meteor and, uh, you know, a huge... Uh, 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 star and obviously this is a foolish understanding actually it's a foolish understanding of the verse itself because chapter 65 verse 5 according to Ibn Kathir he says Ibn Kathir who is a medieval scholar and exegete of the Quran one of the most prolific actually he says it's not the misbah itself it's not the star itself and yes he believes it is a star the masabih are referring to a star even though the word masabih is not synonymous with the word stars because masabih means luminaries things which illuminate in the sky which could be anything I mean, anything which illuminates from the anthropocentric perspective anything from our humanly perspective which illuminates in the sky could be a misbah because misbah literally is a lamp but Ibn Kathir takes the view it is the Nujuma, it is the stars, and he says, he says, actually, it's not the star itself which is pelting the devil. He says, it's not the star itself, but the solar flame which comes from the, from the star. And you'll say, well, this is a long shot. How could he say that? And why would he say that? Well, actually, he was doing tafsir al Quran bil Quran because he was exegeting the Quran with the Quran. Because if you look at chapter 38, verse number 10, it says, إِلَّا مَنْ خَطِفَ الْخَطْفَةَ فَأَتْبَعَهُ شِهَابٌ ثَاقِبٌ it says, except for the one which follows it in course, and therefore uh, it follows it, shihab, which is really a flame, uh, thaqib. So here, this flame, shihab on thaqib, 
uh, is correlated with what is mentioned in chapter 38 of the Quran, Surah as safat where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَلَقَدْ زَيَّنَّا السَّمَاءِ الدُّنْيَا بِزِينَةِ الْكَوَاكِبِ We have therefore adorned the heavens with the zina, with the adornment of al-kawakib. Kawakib means, once again, it could mean stars. So here if you correlate the two verses, it would suggest to, uh, to us that actually it's not the star itself, but it's the shihab of the star. And you say, okay, well, I'm not convinced yet. Maybe that is the case, but I'm not convinced. Okay, if you're not convinced, no problem, because there's another hadith. This one's in Bukhari, where the Prophet himself, he said, La, he said, Rubbama. It could be the case, when he was talking to his companion, that that devil is being pelted by shihab. Once again, shihab means a solar flame. So even if you look at the sunnah, the hadith, literature, once again, we realize that it's not the, uh, the star itself which is pelting the devil, but in fact, it is the solar flame which is being emitted from the star which is pelting the devil. And once again, you'll never be able to see this from, on a metaphysical perspective, but once again, it shows the shallow research and the superficial uh, reading, cursory reading, newspaper reading of those individuals to the Islamic literature. So this is an education for them, and inshallah will be benefit for everybody else. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Today we're going to be talking about the, the matter of six days. And what do we mean? What does the Quran mean when it says six days the universe was created, or the heavens and the earth were created in six days? Does this mean six 24-hour days? And if so, how is it possible? How can it be conceivable that the universe which we know has been around for 13.9 billion years, or at least that's what science tells us, can in any way have been created in six days? Well, to answer this question really, what we have to look at is what the Qur'an actually says and what the Qur'an, what the Arabic words actually mean. To summarize this point, really, the word yawm, which the plural of is ayyam, means any time period. And what is the evidence of that? The evidence of that is the fact that individuals like al Sahani had written in their ma'ajim, their dictionaries a long time ago, that the word yawm is ayy zaman min al-azmin, any period of time. And that is why the Qur'an has this usage of the term in referencing different periods of time. So you'll find in, for example, Surah Al-Sajda, chapter 32 of the Qur'an, in verse number 10, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, يُدَبِّرُ الْأَمْرَ مِنَ السَّمَاءِ إِلَى الْأَرْضِ ثُمَّ يَعْرُجُوا إِلَيْهِ فِي يَوْمٍ كَانَ أَلْفَ سَنَةٍ مِمَّا تَعُدُّونَ That he, that God controls the affair from the heavens to the earth, and then it ascends back uh, to him. In a day, a fi yawmin, kana alfa sanatin mimma ta'udun, that was a thousand years from how you count or from your reckoning. So clearly, here the word yawm is used in reference to a thousand years. And likewise, in chapter 70, verse 5 in Surah Al Ma'arij, it talks about the day of judgment. It says, fi yawmin kana miqdaruhu khamsina alfa sana, in a day which its length is 50,000 years. So how could it be that you have one day that's 1,000 years and another day which is 50,000 years? Well, Ibn Abbas, uh, the cousin of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and the most qualified person after the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to ever deal with exegesis, he actually replies to this question by saying these are two different days. And this is mentioned in Sahih Bukhari, the most authentic book after the Quran. He says, هَذَانِ يَوْمَانِ مُخْتَلِفَانِ These are two completely different days. Uh, and so therefore, you know, a day, in summary, could be any period of time. When Allah talks about the creations of the heavens and the earth in six days, it could mean uh, six 24-hour days. That's a possible meaning. But that's not the only meaning. It could mean any period of uh, six days. So really, or, or, or uh, six periods of time. Therefore, this contention that, well, the universe is 13.9 billion years and how could the Qur'an say it's six days is a fundamentally flawed uh, question to begin with because the six period of time could mean any period of time. Well, I think really what's happening here is that there has been a conflation. There has been a superimposition of the Genesis narrative as per 
um, evangelical kind of fundamentalist, if you want to call it that, or literalist readings uh, of, of Genesis, chapter 1, chapter 2, chapter 5 as well, looking at all those, um, you know, lineage models that are mentioned in, in Genesis chapter 5 in particular, adding them all up and then coming to, um, you know, conclusion that is 6,000 years. And we don't have the equivalent of Genesis chapter 5 in the Quran. We don't have the equivalent of Genesis chapter 5 in the Hadith. So this is not our, really our contention, because quite frankly, it's not something we have to deal with. So in sum, in sum, you know, the day could mean any period of time. And so it's not in conflict with the fact that the universe could have been 14 billion years, or it could be more than that, or it could be less than that. And really, we don't know how long the universe has been around for. Obviously, Big Bang cosmology would, would bring us to the conclusion that it's been 13.9 billion years, but science is far from incorrigible and far from producing of eternal truths. So we remain, if you like, happy to accept whatever science says, and there's no conflict at all between believing in a model of the universe that is 13.9 billion years and believing in the Quran. That's fine, but we don't need to be dogmatic on what it is that the Quran says, uh, or what it means by six periods, nor do we need to be dogmatic at all about the universe being 13.9 billion years. And I hope that answers the question. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Today I'm going to be speaking about something which is actually littered all over the kind of anti-Islamic websites. It's a specious argument, really. Uh, an argument saying that the, you know, the Quran and Hadith or Islam in its primary text indicates that the earth is flat. Let's take a look at the Quran and the commentaries of the early people because I think that's a very important place to start. So if you look at the entirety of the Quran from Fatiha until Nas, you'll find that really the earth is being referred to in different ways. You know, in Surah Al-Baqarah, for example, the very first chapter after Surah Al-Fatiha, the second chapter in the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, هُوَ الَّذِي جَعَلَ لَكُمُ الْأَرْضَ فِرَاشًا وَالسَّمَاءَ بِنَاءً وَأَنزَلَ مِنَ السَّمَاءِ مَاءً You know, he is the one who has made for you the earth as a spread, if you like. And he sent down from the sky water. And if you look at the 88th chapter of the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he asks some rhetorical questions. And one of them, one of those rhetorical questions is, have you not seen the earth? And how it's sotihat, how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made it, smoothed it over. For this reason, some people, actually, in the early times, as well as those individuals who are indicating that this is the only interpretation of Islam, are saying that, well, look, the Quran is indicating that the earth is flat. They'll even look at chapter number, um, chapter number 78 of the Quran, where in the beginning of the surah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, you know, uh, have we not made the earth, the earth as a bed? And this is another argument. They say, well, a bed is flat and therefore the earth is indicated as flat in the Quran. This is not the case uh, because, as early commentators have indicated, people like Ibn Hazm, who is a, you know, fourth century, fifth century scholar, someone who was not influenced and could not have been actually influenced by uh, modern scientific discussions. He says in his book Al-Fisal, he mentions that the, the Quran indicates that the earth is round. And his argument is, in chapter 39, verse 5, Allah says, That in chapter 39, verse 5, God says, He rolls the day into the night. And he rolls the night into the day. And he has made subservient for you the, the, the shams, the sun and the moon, and the qamar. And every single one of those are running in an orbit uh, to a time appointed. To a place appointed. So in other words, chapter 39 verse 5, he says, that taqweer, this taqweer that's taking place could not have been, or could not be a taqweer that takes place on a flat surface. He says that, the taqweer comes from the Arabic word qura, which, mean, which indicates that by necessity, this would mean that the night is rolling into or onto a, a spherical um, kind of surface, and likewise the day, and therefore the earth is round according to the Qur'an. So how does he explain, and other scholars explain, those other verses which we started this, this discussion with, which indicate that the earth is, uh, you know, has been, it's been stretched out, muddat, or it's been, uh, you know, uh, spread out, and so on and so forth. He says, well, if you look on a 
you know, for example, if you look at a plane of the earth, the earth word ard in, in the first place actually means the ground below. So as we're looking at the ground below, we're seeing that it's been smoothed over in opposition to, for example, you know, the craters of the moon. So if you look at the moon and look at the kind of the, 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 the ground on the moon, the craters on the moon is very bumpy. Whereas the earth, uh, the, you know, the, the surface of the earth is very smooth. And that's how they're able to harmonize between the two kinds of verses. Likewise, Ibn Taymiyyah in his Kitab Al-Arsh, which is part of Majmu'at Al-Fatawa, a, a literalist in his own right, or apparentist, whatever way you want to put it, someone who looks at the Qur'an and doesn't even believe in metaphor in the Qur'an. This is one of the only people in the history of Islam who's actually said, we don't, I don't even believe in a, such a thing as a metaphor in the Qur'an. He says that the earth is round. And he, he in fact, even quotes an ijma' on it. He, he quotes a consensus among the scholars on this, on this point. Now, this view, he says, Ibn Taymiyyah, goes all the way back to the early generation, to a person who has a chain of narration called Ibn Munada. So Ibn Munada is someone who comes in the 4th century or the 3rd century and who says that the earth is round and he is one of the students of Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal, another person who um, he, he wasn't going to metaphorize verses of the Qur'an, especially those cosmological ones which could be referring to certain uh, phenomena. Therefore, I think in sum, if we were to be fair to the tradition, I think the most that can be said in terms of making an argument against the Qur'an is that the Qur'an can be interpreted as saying the earth is flat. But you can't say that that is the only valid interpretation. That's an impossible thing to say. In fact, it's ahistorical because it's something which has been disproven by the very fact that the most apparentist and literalist scholars of the early times, people like Ibn Hazm, who was a Zahiri, who was someone who was a literalist, you know, he does not believe in a PS, uh, analogy, or someone like Ibn Taymiyyah, who does not believe in majaz, or um, metaphorization of the Qur'an. People like that, and Ahmed ibn Hanbal and his ashab, people like Ibn Munada, they said the earth is round, and they based their view on, uh, they based their view on the Qur'an and the verses of it. So, this specious argument that's leveled uh, the, uh, the Qur'an or Islam is exactly that. It's, it's, it's really a weak argument with very little explanatory or refutational power when it comes to the historical exegetical works of the Muslim scholars. And so for this reason, we say this is a null and void refutation, which I can't even believe, quite frankly, I can't even fathom how this has made the top 10 of the most, if you like, uh, popular interrogations against Islam in these uh, the weak uh, websites against Islam. I can't believe it, that people actually take these arguments uh, as carrying any kind of weight. And they continually use these arguments, despite the fact that the evidences have been shown time and time again. But these people are not ready and, uh, ready and willing to listen to this evidence, so we just have to put it out there. فَمَنْ شَاءَ فَالْيُؤْمِنُ وَمَنْ شَاءَ as the Quran says, whoever wants to can believe, and whoever wants to can disbelieve. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Well, I hope all of those videos that you have just watched, or indeed if you have just even watched some of those videos, were able to challenge your thought process or satiate your curiosity. We would like your feedback. If you are someone who was suffering from some kind of doubt, whether or not this series has helped you. So we will link a poll where you can tell us whether how satisfied and convinced you have been with the answers you have been given. This will give us a chance, an opportunity to be able to introspect and to self-reflect and to improve our service. Positive reinforcement is as good as negative reinforcement and vice versa. So tell us what you think needs to be changed uh, by emailing us on the email below, or indeed, as I've mentioned, by telling us, by polling, uh, how convincing you have thought these answers to be. The conclusion of all of this is the approach of trying to use science to attack Islam has really a failed, been a failed approach. Not least because science, it assumes scientism the idea that science is om omniscient, if you like, 
as one of its presuppositions. Scientism is something which is almost rejected fully by the philosophical community, except in uh, evangelical corners of new atheist propaganda. And so the interlocutor who believes in this must really come forward and explain himself or herself as to why they believe in scientism is true in the first place, or how can it be demonstrably proven to be true. The truth of the matter is, as we have been showing throughout this series, the Qur'an has an inbuilt flexibility and facilitation, which allows people from the 7th century all the way through to the 21st century and beyond to be able to make sense of the book according to the cosmologies and modern day scientific theories of the day. In other words, I don't have to, as a Muslim, sacrifice my understanding of science in order to be a practicing Muslim. I don't have to have some kind of cognitive dissonance in seeing an observable reality in one way and approaching the text in another. I don't have to resort to huge conspiracy theories relating to the, to the age of the universe and the existence or lack thereof of dinosaurs or the coexistence of dinosaurs and human beings or any of the kind of propaganda that we're seeing with new age uh, literalists from the Christian, from our Christian co-religionists. We don't need to do any of that. We can, and this is unique within the Islamic tradition, maintain an absolute, for the most part, literal understanding where the language is clearly literal of the naturalistic verses and not be out of line with that which we generally know to be observed reality uh, today in the 21st century. I think this is something which can easily be argued to be unique to the Islamic tradition and something which, once again, allows a rational person to be able to make life decisions about religion which doesn't compromise a rationality for spirituality or vice versa. This removes cognitive dissonance from the equation and allows someone to become fully actualized spiritually and rationally. And this is why uh, you could argue one of the clear reasons, this multi-layered approach of the Qur'an of facilitation, why a proof, you could say, of the Qur'anic authorship from a divine, all-knowing, all-wise God. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.